Members of council, if I can please have you take your seats. If you can please stand for the national anthem. Please remain standing, and during this time, please remember the following persons who have passed away. Isabel Anderson, Antonio Nino Cicerello, Father Pier Giorgio De Chico, Rocco Di Donato, Diane Ford, William Bill Graham, Marilyn Lastman, and Michael McGee, and the victims of Ukraine International Airlines Flight 752. Thank you. I would also like to acknowledge that we have Nick and Pat Di Donato that's uh, here in the council chambers. Um, my condolence goes out to your family. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Holliday, you wish to say a few words at this time? Thank you, Madam Speaker. I just wish to acknowledge uh, the family of Michael McGee in the chamber here, his wife Elizabeth of 21 years, his sons Lucas and Matthew, and his brother and sister Maureen and Paul, just in the front row here along with uh, some of the parks forestry and recreation staff. Um, I was uh, part of a, a team of people that were working on the Etobicoke Olympian. I, I should really say the staff, but um, <clears throat> they included me in the conversations and Michael was part of that. Um, he passed away suddenly over the holidays, uh, early, unexpected, uh, and it's, it's a big loss. Um, just, uh, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge a little bit of Michael's work. He was with the city for 28 years, and he was a supervisor in the aquatics programs. Um, the Olympium is an incredibly important place, and uh, he was uh, helping make some improvements to that. It's the, the really the only major pool in central Etobicoke, um, and he was a big contributor to aquatics, which is a large thing in, in uh, my part of the city. Um, I can tell you, I, I learned to swim at the Olympium. Uh, boy, even my son was just at swimming lessons there last night, uh, and my girls as well are, are part of aquatics, and they've enjoyed that. And uh, you know, his contributions uh, to the Learn to Swim program across the city are huge. And so um, while we, we recognize and offer our condolences, um, to Michael's family, um, I also just wanted to say thank you as well for the work that he did um, to build the city of Toronto that we have and really improve the quality of life for all of the inhabitants. And uh, we all know those real stories and uh, we regret that he has passed and he will be missed. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Holliday. We acknowledge the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, 
the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. It's now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. For the benefit of those who are connected to the internet, the city clerk has posted all of the agenda materials for today's meetings at toronto.ca slash council. Members, we have a presentation this morning to recognize Patricia Walcott, General Manager, Toronto Employment and Social Services, on her retirement from the City of Toronto. I would like to call upon Deputy City Manager, Juliana Carbone, to come forward for the presentation. Good morning, Madam. Someone who may not have been here as long as some of us have, but during her six years has had such meaningful impact on our organizations, our programs and services, and most importantly, on the lives of our most vulnerable residents here in Toronto. Pat Walcott, our General Manager of Employment and Social Services, is retiring after a very successful 45-year career in public service. Before Pat joined the city, she had a very long and successful career with the federal government, 45 years there. Or no, 40 years in, in, at the federal level, and she started at an entry-level position and then worked her way up to a senior executive director. In 2009, while she was working with the federal government, Pat received the Lieutenant Governor's Distinction, um, Distinction of, uh, Medal of Distinction in Public Administration. My apologies. It's the highest honour that anyone in public service can receive. So needless to say, in 2013, when she joined the City of, of Toronto as our general manager, we were very excited. Now, Pat's accomplishments, her contributions to this city and to uh, employment and social services are far too vast to talk about in detail today. Everything from the successful expansion of our pay program, the launch of our transit fare equity program, integrating Ontario Works and ODSB in three of our service locations, the list goes on. But what I can honestly tell you is Pat has been so instrumental in driving positive, sustainable change, always focused on improving the quality and level of service and services and supports that our residents receive, creating a workplace culture and environment which is very positive both for staff and clients, modernizing service delivery as well as our back office operational processes, and always ensuring that diversity and engagement of staff and our clients is always a top priority. Right from the get-go, Pat had a vision for how Toronto's vulnerable residents needed to be served. And she fully appreciated that given that social assistance is so highly regulated by the province, she wasn't going to be able to bring that vision to life without their cooperation and buy-in. And I can tell you it took Pat no time at all to establish very close, well-respected, trusted partnerships with our provincial colleagues. And it was through those trusted partnerships that she's been so influential in helping guide provincial um, program and policy directions. And more recently, co-chairing the provincial municipal committee that oversees the modernization of social assistance, Pat has been able to influence, um, help shape future service delivery for both financial and employment services. Now, as you can well imagine, helping the province meet its budget and program visions while protecting the overall integrity of a very complex social assistance system is a pretty daunting task. But in true Pat fashion, she took on that role with the utmost of integrity, passion, commitment, commitment but most importantly, compassion for the vulnerable people that we serve both as a city and as a province. Pat, you are such an integral part, a valued part of our leadership here at the city, and you're going to be truly missed. I extend to you, on behalf of all of us, our, our heartfelt thank you for your contributions and your commitment to helping advance community and social services here at the city, continually enhancing the level of services that our residents need, and promoting and modeling our public health, our sorry, public service values in all that you do. So I wish you all the best in this next phase of your life but we have some expectations of you. We want you to keep coming up with those bold ideas, getting things done, and of course, staying connected with us.
Uh, Pat, uh, there are a couple of things actually to add to that, but I, I stand here as a representative, a member of the City Council and as Mayor to add my words of thanks and appreciation to those uh, so well put by uh, Juliana. Uh, when I arrived here, and it was, wasn't that long after uh, you did, um, I sort of uh, had come into contact with you before because I'd had some involvement, I forget whether it was through civic action or in some other way with the pay program, which you were so uh, instrumental in supporting and, and uh, showing leadership to. And you just seemed to me like one of those people that had been here for 25 or 30 years. And I say that in the most complimentary way because there are so many, <laughs> there are so many people here who are such an important part of the institutional fabric of this place and of this city that keep things going and do represent the institutional memory and so on. But it turns out, in fact, that you hadn't been. But it certainly is the case that uh, in the years that we were able to have you here as part of a remarkable overall 45-year uh, uh, career in public service, you created an impression such through your work that you had been uh, here for that long and had become, in fact, in a short time, part of that uh, institutional fabric. And that's because I think in every encounter I had with you, whether it was at a job fair that we were at together or in meetings we were having discussing how to provide hope for young people, um, you epitomize the values that are the values, I think, of the council of the, and of the city and of the people who live uh, in the city of Toronto. I think people forget that the job that you had, uh, you know, and this is often forgotten about in the context of much of what Toronto is, this is the third largest social assistance delivery provider in all of Canada. Uh, it's a big, uh, a big I, by calling it an operation, I dehumanize it, but it's a big uh, function that is performed in the city that affects the lives of an awful lot of people. And uh, so just administering that alone in a way that is competent and compassionate is a big job. But you've also then gone beyond that to help us with some projects that I think we can be most proud of in terms of what we do here at the City Council. For years and years and years, there had been debated and discussed and proposed and studied the idea of creating some kind of a low-income fair pass for people to help them with the expense that is involved in accessing public transportation to get to that job opportunity or to get to school or to get to wherever people were going. And it was something that you were instrumental in helping us to bring to reality so that for the first time, and it's still a work in progress, we are actually able to provide that to our citizens. Uh, we have, uh, I've mentioned the pay program. I mean, this is a shining star success story for the city of Toronto. If you look at the percentage success, and people are talking quite rightly all the time about taking programs that we initiate here and measuring how well they do in achieving the desired outcome, the pay program uh, is one that takes a hugely evident skill set on the part of younger people and gives them the self-confidence, I think, more than anything else, and a chance to show what they can do. And of course, as you know, um, it has a huge success uh, rate, and you have helped us to grow it in terms of the number of employers, grow it, therefore, in terms of the number of young people who benefit from it. And I think in giving those people hope and showing others that you can have that kind of hope, it's been an immensely important uh, contribution to the well-being of the city. And then beyond even that, whenever trouble came up, uh, trouble in the form of an ice storm or in the f form of a, a, an, an influx of asylum seekers to the city uh, or residents who were displaced through fires and, and, and through no fault of their own, you were there uh, to help us in that practical get things done way that uh, Juliana made mention to with the first and foremost thing that you are uh, focused on and have continued to be focused on being the well-being of our residents. And so I only say uh, in, in furthering the words of uh, Juliana that we hope uh, that uh, retirement doesn't mean that we've seen the last of you. I know your partner and members of your family are here, so we're counting on them. And I don't think we'll have to do much counting on them to make sure you come back here and that you don't uh, be shy about sending along your suggestions as to how we can continue to run that kind of compassionate, capable government that you are so much a part of. Uh, and I want to, and I, I, I diminish these things, and I never mean to, but I sort of say I wish I could give you a new car or a, or a <laughs> trip somewhere. But I think, as you realize, in public service, that isn't... Uh, isn't always possible, but this, uh, which comes from the members of the Toronto City Council, comes with our utmost re respect and affection and gratitude for your public service here and elsewhere. Um, and I hope you'll put it in a place of pride uh, and, and it will remind you always of the wonderful contribution you've made to building a great city. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, Juliana and Mayor Tory, for these very kind words. I will resist the advice at the moment, but I will be on my email. Thank you. 
I'm both overwhelmed and extremely grateful to have had this opportunity to cap off a public service career here in Toronto at the municipal level. I've often remarked to friends and family that working in the Toronto Public Service is a privilege. I'm extremely proud of the work that we do here, and I'm particularly proud of the staff at Toronto Employment and Social Services. The excellent service they provide on a daily basis, the passion with which they deliver those services, and the impact and difference they make to people's lives to thousands of, of residents actually in Toronto. It's a great source of pride to me. Being the general manager of this division has really been quite a humbling experience. I really would like to take this opportunity to thank City Council for their support over the years. I will admit when I first joined the city and realized that I would be attending council and responding to questions on the floor, it was a bit overwhelming and maybe even daunting. But I soon came to realize that being invited to attend and participate in meetings was an honor and a civic duty. And as a senior uh, city staff, it's a unique opportunity to interact with elected officials uh, in ways that staff who work in other orders of government do not. So that really was a privilege. A special thanks to Juliana, my deputy city manager. I really have the utmost respect for you, both personally and professionally. I appreciate the, the autonomy you gave me to do what I needed to do. Uh, when you're coming as a senior person who's had a long public service career, you're not looking for the micromanagement, obviously. But I appreciate it even more knowing that I could call you any time for advice, guidance, or support, and you're always on the other end of the phone. I know that I, along with our other uh, division head colleagues, have benefited greatly from your leadership. Uh, to my senior leadership team who are sitting over here, uh, I really wanna thank you for your steadfast support. I've been extremely fortunate over the years to have uh, a group of people who are incredibly talented, intelligent, and dedicated. The decision to retire, therefore, even after 48 years, was really not an easy one, because I've enjoyed it here immensely. Yes, I'm very proud of the achievements. I've been proud to be part of very important changes and innovative work, and it's because you don't often get the opportunity to see firsthand the impact of the work that you do. But in my case, on a daily basis, I have clients tell me what a difference a training program made to their self-confidence, about a job that connected them, and what it means now in terms of hope for them and for their family and what it means to be able to afford to travel on the TTC, and the gratitude they feel for the fact that a caseworker simply took the time to listen, to care, and to check in. It's a great city. I'm proud and honored to have served these residents. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Councillor McAlvey, uh, you have a brief announcement. Yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. There's a very special occasion on Saturday, February 1st, and thank you for the opportunity to share a short video about this momentous occasion. My first media, media appearance, appearance after, after winning, winning the election, election was, was with my, my friend, friend Mike Cole. Cole. I realized in that moment that I could learn a lot from him. He has an interesting way of getting his point across. I call them Colisms. We have our own Berlin Wall, seen right through the middle of the city. 
it's called the Allen Expressway. So I reached out to some of his friends to ask for their favorites. Mike, I hear we're under attack by Norwegians. Could you explain that to me in Canadian Tire English, please? You don't see Italian walking around with plastic cups. The member opposite has more positions than the Kama Sutra. I want to get to the wonderful hidden park that Frances Nunziata has. We can't get to it. She's keeping it sort of separated from us. Wait, Mike, I'm moving you out of order now. Please sit down. There's, There's an academic pothole. North Korea claims they were perfect democracies. They made the system bulletproof. No one intended. I mistakenly thought most of us were like supposed. I had no idea it was not Really? The credit card system. How can you get in the city of the world? It works. Who put it in the credit system? Listen, I've, I've never, never seen, seen a tomato, tomato in a fruit salad. salad. Happy birthday, Mike. We all love you. Happy birthday, Mike. Happy birthday, Mike. We love you. Happy birthday, Mike. Happy birthday, Mike. Happy birthday, Mike. We love having you here. Happy birthday, Mike. We could really use you here. Mike, I'm proud of you. I can't believe that you survived the seven years. Happy birthday, Mike. Happy birthday, Mike. Great to see you. Happy seventh birthday. Happy birthday, Cousin Michael! Happy birthday, Mike, whatever the number is. Happy birthday, Mike, it's great to see you running in the neighborhood. Happy 75th birthday, Mike. Happy 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 birthday, Mike. Thank you, Madam Speaker. There was no shortage of people that wanted to contribute to this video commemorating the 75th birthday of our colleague, Councillor Michael Cole. Um, we all adore you. This comes from a place of love. Thank you for representing your residents so well, and thank you for keeping us all smiling as you do that. Happy birthday. Thank you. All right. Um, oh, Councillor Cole, sit down. Okay, what do you want to say? God, if, if only your father was here. Anyways, uh, he would agree with me. I now, know, he Anyways, would be angry. Uh, God bless him. I just want to say thank you so much. Uh, I feel so privileged of having the opportunity to be here. Believe me, it is an opportunity we all have to do good for the city, and I feel so lucky to be doing it, and I feel so fortunate to have done this for so many years because it really shows what an incredible place, uh, you know, this is for good. So I want to thank you all, and there's some cake I baked this morning, and everybody should try my uh, Sicilian tangerine cake. Have a piece. <laughs> Thank you. I will now call for a motion to confirm the minutes. Councillor Bylaw, you have a motion on the minutes from our last meeting. Yes, Madam Speaker, that City Council confirm the minutes of Council from the regular meeting held on December 17 and 18, 2019, and the form supplied to the members. All in favor, carried. Members of Council, we have um, <clears throat> two administrative inquiries from Councillor Ainsley before us today. The first is Administrative Inquiry 14.1 regarding delays in traffic construction projects through Scarborough and Guildwood, or 24. The General Manager of Transportation Services answer to this inquiry was distributed with your suppl supplementary materials yesterday and has been posted on the City's website. May I have a motion to receive the inquiry and answer for information? Councillor Ainsley. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to move a motion to refer to the Infrastructure and Environment Committee. Okay. We have a motion. All in favor? Carry. The second administrative inquiry is 14.2 regarding open data cycling and infrastructure program. 
bike share ridership. The Toronto Parking Authority's answer to this inquiry was also distributed with your supplementary materials yesterday and has been posted on the city's website. May I have a motion to receive the inquiry and answer for information, Councillor Ainsley? Uh, good morning, everyone. I'd like to move a motion, Madam Speaker, to refer this to the Executive Committee. Okay. All in favor? Carried. I will now call upon the committee chairs to introduce their reports. The chairs can speak about the reports for up to five minutes. Mayor Tory, you have a motion to introduce the executive committee report. I do, uh, Madam Speaker. I move that report from meeting 12 of the executive committee listed on the agenda of council be presented for uh, consideration. It's interesting, Madam Speaker, just in speaking to that agenda and the items that will be before us today, that uh, if you look at them, uh, very few of them were uh, the subject of a lot of controversy, but they were all the subject of considerable public interest, or a number of them, in terms of the deputations that people came uh, to make. And that is because I think um, it is an agenda that uh, is consisting of items that were all about moving the city forward in a way that was really very much devoted to the, uh, to the longer term, uh, to uh, protecting our success, to making sure that 10 years from today, uh, the city can still be as well regarded on many of those objective uh, uh, assessments that are made of the quality of life in cities across the world and, and on which we do uh, so well at the present time. Uh, so we have in this report uh, two items that I've made my key items, the Ravine uh, implementation strategy, where not only uh, during uh, the last uh, six years have we come forward uh, finally with a Ravine a strategy, a lot of excellent work done, especially by our public servants, but also by outside uh, organizations, including a lot of nonprofit organizations. But we've now come forward with the second part, which becomes even harder than the first, with an implementation plan. And um, I will be supporting, uh, and have indicated so, uh, the, the commencement of the funding on an operational basis for some of the things that have to be done right away, including invasive species, litter control, and so on and we'll be moving as quickly as possible to add to, and I think people have to remember this, that we already have some $400 million committed in the existing 10-year capital plan to uh, Ravine uh, Works, uh, and we'll be adding another 100 plus million, and I will be uh, relentless in my efforts to uh, seek out some of that money, if we can get it, from both the other governments. Uh, the federal government in particular has indicated a strong degree of interest in this. I've seen already four or five uh, federal ministers about this. We'll be doing so again next week. Uh, and also from private philanthropy, because we've seen with the examples of the Bentway, uh, the Meadowway, where families like the Matthews and the Westons and other people like that want to contribute to the natural and other uh, important bones of the city uh, to make sure that long after they're gone, long after we're gone, uh, the city uh, has uh, protected and enhanced these, uh, these things. Uh, the second is Rail Deck Park. And you'll see correspondence in front of you, and perhaps already the agenda item has served a purpose uh, in that it has uh, drawn to the attention of those with whom we must uh, try to negotiate the fact that we're serious about this park. It's going to go forward. It's going to go forward because there are tens of thousands of people already living downtown who I'm not sure even in the best of plans were contemplated with their families as living downtown. And that's why we've built schools. That's why we're in the middle of building uh, with the leadership of councillors like Joe Cressy and Mike Layton, the magnificent community centre. And, and uh, the one thing that we have not been able to do thus far is to make sure there is adequate parkland for those tens of thousands of people there now and those to come. And that is their backyard. It will be their backyard, these parks that we're talking about, including the Rail Deck Park, beyond the fact that it will also serve, I believe, as a magnet for people from across the city uh, to come and use and as a, uh, a huge tourist attraction. Because make no mistake, with our help in this room, this is going to be a park of global standard that people are going to want to come and see uh, when they come uh, to visit Toronto. And so that's going to move forward, and I think we now have the attention so we can take a try at negotiating, but this recommendation says that if those negotiations prove as fruitless, quite frankly, as uh, the limited discussions that have taken place to date have proven, that we can move forward and take the step that is entirely appropriate, and it will be governed by the appropriate laws and all the fairness that goes with those, which is to move forward to expropriate the beginnings of this park adjacent to a private sector initiative that will give us more park faster uh, in the core of downtown. I'll just mention two other things before I sit down. One is the digital infrastructure, and the second is the transit report. And again, they fit into that category I talked about, which is doing things that are going to be vital to the successful future of the city. 
The transit report is just an update saying here's what we're doing to make sure we pave the way to, uh, to get on with those transit projects and the digital infrastructure is a vitally important thing that is not just about any one project on the waterfront or anywhere else, but it is about a respectful, uh, effective, uh, sensible, uh, uh, series of policies that we can put in place to protect people and their data, but at the same time to make sure that we can make use of that data to move the city forward. And that's a very careful, delicate balancing act with lots more consultation to come on that. So I commend all these items to the members of council and look forward to discussing them uh, in the next day or so. Thanks, Madam Speaker. Thank you. <clears throat> Councillor Cressy, you have a motion to introduce the Board of Health report. I do, Speaker, uh, that the report from meeting 13 of the Board of Health listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. And let me just make a brief comment, which is that I think the issue which is not in front of us today, but is taking most of our time at public health right now, is the new cor coronavirus. And I think on behalf of all of us, first, we should thank and commend our professional and hardworking staff in Toronto Public Health and across city divisions for their tireless and nonstop work. And I think I want to say that while this news may be concerning for many Torontonians. As chair of the Board of Health, I want to provide some reassurance that at each level of government, experienced public health staff have systems in place exactly for this reason, to prepare for, to detect, and to respond to communicable diseases. This is the work they do each and every single day, and the risk to Torontonians remains low. And so on behalf, I believe, of our entire council, I just want to restate and reaffirm our full confidence in the tireless work of our medical officer of health and our entire interdivisional staff team. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Deputy Mayor Minowong, you have a motion to introduce the Civic Appointments Committee report? Yes, thank you. The report for meeting 12 of the Civic Appointments Committee listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. Thank you. Councillor Thompson, you have a motion to introduce the Economic and Community Development Committee report. Uh, yes, Speaker, and good morning. That the report from meeting 11 of the Economic and Community Development Committee listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. Thank you. Councillor Ainsley, you have a motion to introduce the General Government and Licensing Committee report. Hi, good morning, Madam Speaker. That the report from meeting number 11 of the General Government and Licensing Committee listed on the agenda of the Council be presented for consideration. Thank you. Councillor Pasternak, you have a motion to introduce the Infrastructure and Environment Committee report. Yes, I do. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. The report from meeting 11 of the Infrastructure Environment Committee listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. I understand we're in agreement that, 11, that items 11, 1, 2, and 3 will be uh, dealt with together as they are um, uh, covering many tree issues, uh, the tree canopy, tree protection, uh, how to plant more trees, and of course tapping federal funds for a massive tree uh, planting program. And those are some of the key items in uh, today's agenda. Thank you. Councillor Bailao, you have a motion to introduce the Planning and Housing Committee report. Thank you, Madam Speaker, that the report from meeting 12 of the Planning and Housing Committee listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. Thank you. Councillor Grimes, you have a motion to introduce the Tobacco York Community Council report. Yes, we do, and good morning, Madam Speaker. At the report from meeting 12 of the Etobicoke York Community Council, this is on the agenda of the Council be presented for consideration. And why I'm up, Madam Speaker, I don't have a video, but I'd like to wish my wife Anne a very happy birthday today. Oh. Oh. Councillor. I'll do that one. I'll go over to your house. Councillor Pasternak, you have a motion to, do, to introduce the North York Community Council report. Yes, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. The, the report for meeting 12 of the North York Community Council listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. I'd like my, with my wife uh, uh, a belated birthday. It was yesterday. We, cel <laughs> we celebrated yesterday, but it's the first time I can give a video. Uh, congratulations. Um, one of the things that we did at uh, North York Community Council uh, was we paid tribute to two long-term employees of the City of Toronto uh, who retired. Uh, Joe Nanos, the Director of Community Planning in North York District, uh, is retiring, or is retired now, 
after 32 years uh, with the city of Toronto, and he shaped uh, many of the large infrastructure and planning projects across the city uh, during that time. And he made a major contribution uh, to, to planning and building in North York uh, in the time he was there. I'd also like to um, pay tribute to uh, Francine Adamo, who, who also retired after 49 years uh, with the city of Toronto. And uh, I only knew her uh, recently, uh, but certainly as chair of Northrop Community Council, she was a major asset in making sure uh, that uh, everything stayed on track. Uh, when you're chairing a, a standing committee or a community council, there's so many moving parts with other councillors, with deputants, with members of the public, with staff, with a 200-page agenda, and you need the clerks right beside you to make sure everything stays on track, to keep the trains keep moving on time. And Francine did a remarkable job across the city over almost half a century of time. She touched almost every public policy issue uh, regarding the clerk's office, and she made a, a remarkable contribution to city building. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Councillor Kergianis, you have a motion to introduce the Scarborough Community Council report. Good morning, Madam Speaker. Mm -hmm. The report reads that the report from meeting 12 of Scarborough Community Council listed on the agenda of council be presented for consideration. Thank you. Councillor Perks, you have a motion to introduce the Toronto and East York Community Council report. Good morning, Speaker. I move that the report from meeting 12 of the Toronto East York Community Council listed on the agenda of council be presented for consideration. Thank you. Councillor Fletcher, you have a motion to introduce the new business and business previously requested from city officials. Yes, good morning, speaker and colleagues. I move that the new business and business previously requested from city officials listed on the agenda of council be presented for consideration. Thank you. Thank you. All those in favor of the motions recorded vote. Unanimously, 23 in favor. Thank you. Are there any declarations of interest? Please indicate the committee, the item or motion number, and the nature of the interest. And remember that you must also file a written declaration of your interest with the city clerk. Councillor Holliday. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I would like to declare an interest on item EX 12.4, headed acquisitions and expropriations of airspace related to Rail Deck Park. The nature of my interest is with respect to this aspect of the proposed rail deck park, I now have a deemed interest as members of my family have a property interest in the vicinity of the subject of the report. Thank you. I will now call for petitions. Are there any petitions at this time? Members, I will now review the order paper. We have two deferred committee items, uh, TH 11.9 on alterations to heritage properties, authority to enter into a heritage easement agreement and designation at uh, 303, 305, 309, 311, 315, and 319 King Street West to be considered with the related new business item CC 14.2 on 301 to 319 King Street zoning bylaw amendment application request for directions regarding a local planning appeal tribunal hearing. And item TE 11.35 on residential on street permit parking status update on the expansion of the on street parking on the in the Toronto and East York Community Council area. The mayor has designated item EX 12.1 on ravine strategy and item EX 12.4 on acquisitions and expropriation of airspace related to rail deck park as this key matters for this meeting. Uh, these will be the first items of business today. I propose that council consider 
related items, IE 11.1 and IE 11.2 and IE 11.3 on the 2018 tree canopy study and enforcement of tree protection with the mayor's first key item, EX 12.1 on the ravine strategy. Mayor Tory, do you consent to the joining of these items with your key matter? Okay, thank you. The notice of motion run through is scheduled for 2 p.m. tomorrow only if the mayor's key items are completed. I propose the City Council set a time for a closed session if required later in the meeting. The City Clerk has noted the items that members wish to hold. I will now go through the items listed on the order paper to take additional holds. I will recognize requests to make matters urgent and time specific after I go through the items for additional holds. Once the order paper has been approved by Council, any change will need a two-thirds vote. Page three. Councillor Cressy. Uh, thank you, Speaker. On page three, item TE 11.9, alterations to heritage properties, and this item is being joined, as you mentioned, with page nine, item CC 14.2, 301 to 319 King Street West. Uh, staff in our office are still in conversations uh, with the applicant, and so I have an amendment to defer the, both of these items until the February 27th meeting. Okay, you have, the staff have your motion? They do. There's two, okay. one for each item. Okay, so we put it on the screen. Okay, all in favor, carry, second motion. All in favor, carried. Page four. <coughs> Councillor Fletcher. Yes, uh, EX 12.10, Waterfront Toronto Consent to Borrow and Encumber Assets Extension Request. I'm just going to have a few questions from staff. If I can do that offline, I will, Speaker. No, okay, so EX 12.10, you're holding. Thank you. Councillor Cressy. Uh, thank you, Speaker. On page four, item HL 13.8, Subway Health Impact Study. Uh, I can release that item. Okay, on page four, HL 13.8. Okay, we'll hold it. Thank you. Yes, Councillor Wong Tam. Yes, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. On page four, EX 12.9, authority to enter into a service agreement with the Canadian Red Cross for emergency social service. I'd like to hold that, as well as item CE 11.4, Investments, Employment and Training as part of the Region Park Social Development Plan. Thank you very much. Thank you. Page five. Uh, Councillor Fletcher. Sorry, my apologies. On page four, EC 11.4, Investments, Employment and Training as part of Region Councilor Park. Councillor Wong-Tam just held that. Oh, did she? Oh, I missed that. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Page five, Councillor Perks. Uh, GL 11.4, Review of Enhanced Security Measures at Toronto City Hall. Thank you. Councillor Pasternak. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to hold IE 11.8, Logistics and Legal Implications of Eliminating Right Away. And um, you've combined 11.3 with rail deck. We wanted, we Wait, wanted there, the no, forestry we, items, we, the tree planting yeah, the forestry items yes, combined, we, all taken together, the yes, three items. With the, okay. with the ravine strategy, yes. Okay, yes. thank you. Um, page six. Councillor Baila. Um, Madam Speaker, item uh, PH 12.1, uh, Provincial Consultation on Ontario's Building Code Service Delivery. I would be able to uh, move that with the report, uh, the, the supplementary report from yesterday, if uh, everybody would be okay. We can just vote on it. Okay, it's on the screen. Recorded.
Yes, recorded on the amendment. Councillor Crawford, please. The amendment carries unanimously 23 in favor. Okay, item is amended. On favor, carried. Councillor Ainsley. Uh, Madam Speaker, IE 11.17 electric vehicle strategy. Uh, I'm going to release my hold to Councillor Layton. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> Councillor Cressy. Okay. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I'm actually going back to page four. I just spoke with Councillor Cole, who is happy to have HL 13.8 subway health impact study to be released. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't hear that, Councillor Cressy. Uh, my apologies, Speaker. Page yeah. four, item HL 13.8 subway health impact study. Right. Uh, Councillor Cole had indicated that he had questions. We just spoke. He does not, so I can release it. Okay. On page four, then HL 13.8. On favor, carried. Procedural bylaws, more of a fluid document. Page seven. Um, the board's going to pass this to <laughs> Councillor Thompson. Oh, okay. I thought my name was removed there, Speaker. Um, on SC 12.6, uh, uh, Speaker, I have a motion. I'd like to um, refer this um, item to the April uh, Council meeting. April? April yes, SC 12.6. That's uh, 1880, 1890 Eglinton Avenue East, 1523, 1545 Victoria Park Avenue. Official plan amendment application request for direction. Staff are working with the um, the uh, the applicant. Uh, they're almost at a point of agreement, but they have not arrived fully there. I think they'll be able to get there by April. Okay. On the motion, on favor, carried. Oh, Councillor Thompson. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. SC twelve point one six. Traffic Control Signal Review, Lawrence Avenue East and Valparaiso Avenue. I'd like to ask for a recorded vote on that item, please. Okay, recorded vote on page 7, SC 12.16. 12. Recorded vote. Councillor Karajanis, please. Councillor Peruzza, please. The item is adopted unanimously, 24 in favor. Thank you. Councillor Perks. Thank you, Speaker. Um, item TE 12.3299 Glen Lake Avenue Zoning Bylaw Amendment Application Final Report. I can release that. Okay, on page 70, 12.3, on favor, carry. <coughs> page 8. Councillor Fletcher. Yes, I have a motion. The clerks have it for TE 12.17, and that's <coughs> to defer 1151 Queen Street East on the amendment for final report. Um, as very excited that they're looking at putting um, geothermal at this site. They're exploring that and they'd like a little more time. So I'll refer that to February 27th. Why, thank you. <laughs> I, I think that I'll just say it again then. I'm moving to defer 12.7 TE 
to February 27th because the applicant is exploring geothermal at this site and they need, need another month. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. On the motion, on favor, carry Councillor Layton. Yes, thank you very much. Item TE 12.5250 Dundas Street West Zoning Bylaw Amendment Application. I'd like to um, uh, move the recommendations in the supplemental report. Okay, so on page 8, TE 12.5, Councillor Layton is moving the recommendations from the supplementary report. Is everyone okay? All in favor? Carried. Page nine. Councillor Fillion. Uh, thank you. Two items. The first, uh, CC 14.5, I'd like to hold. And the second, uh, CC 14.1, which I have held for Councillor Robinson. Uh, I would like to move that consideration of the item be deferred until the April 1st and 2nd, 2020 meeting of city council. There are ongoing uh, discussions to um, arrive at a successful conclusion on this application and Council Robinson has asked that we uh, defer it to allow that to be completed. Okay, on CC 14.1, motion is on the screen. On favor? Carried. Councilor Wong Tam. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Uh, I'd like to hold CC 14.7, Recovery of Cost 650 Parliament Street. Thank you. Thank you. Page 10. Okay. Um, on page 8, T12.32, it's here without a recommendation. Um, so, Councillor, I, I believe Councillor Matlow, it's in your ward. You, you'll hold the item. I will now consider request to make items urgent and time. Okay, hold on. On page nine. Hold on. Where is it? Where is it? Oh, here it is. Yes. Got bad advice on which page. Uh, page ten. Um, page CC, ten or nine? Uh, ten, Madam Speaker. Okay. CC fourteen point ten, section thirty-seven and forty-five funds not received. Okay. That's fine. We can do it today. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll talk to so, Councillor uh, Malo is holding on page 10, CC 14.10. Councillor Bylaw, you 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 have your name up. Uh, you asked for time specific items? Yes, yeah. yes. Sorry. Yes. Yep. So, on page uh, 3, EX 12.3, item Toronto Ontario Transit Partnership. Uh, if I could have that timed for tomorrow after members' motions. Okay. On favor, carried. Councillor Fletcher, time specific. Yes, uh, EX 12.2, digital infrastructure plan. Can I have that time for uh, this afternoon, please, after lunch? Oh, well, as long as we're. we're it, we've yeah, after the, the mayor's. mayor's uh, key item. Yeah, I'm sure we'll be finished those by so, then. Following the mayor's key items? No, first item after lunch. No, I can't do that. No. Okay, after the mayor's key items. Yes. Whatever okay. you'd like. Okay. But I can't do it right now. Yeah. <laughs> on favor? Carried. All those in favor of adopting the order paper and all items not held, recorded vote.
Councillor Wong Tam, please. Councillor Bailout, please. The motion to adopt the order paper carries unanimously 24 in favor. Thank you. Members of Council, I want to stress the importance of preparing your motions in advance. The clerk staff are here to help you prepare your motions. In particular, if you intend to move a motion during the release of holds, I will insist that your motion be prepared in advance and given to the clerk. If you do not have your motion ready, I will not recognize you. I'm also reminding members that you must state your motion first before you speak to it. If you have an urgent motion without notice you wish to bring forward at this meeting, please give your motion to the city clerk staff. Your motion must clearly state the reason for urgency. Staff will prepare the necessary procedure motion for my review along with your motion. I will review all motions without notice carefully. I may ask you to provide more information about the urgency of your motion and why it can't be rooted through normal committee channels. This will inform my decision on whether to consent to your motion and in turn council's decision about whether to add your motion to the agenda. The purpose of your motion and your reason for urgency must be clear. I will advise council after each recess which motions I have agreed on urgent and that need a motion to add to the agenda. It will require 18 votes to add a motion without notice to the agenda during this meeting. Motions added to the agenda in this way are not subject to a vote to waive referral to a committee or agency. We will now proceed with the mayor's key item, which is EX 12.1, to be considered with items IE 11.1, IE 11.2, and IE 11.3. If, um, if I can please have some quiet, um, please. Members of council, staff, public, please. It's awfully noisy. Councillor Peruzza, Councillor Crawford, please. Okay, so we're at EX 12.1 and the other items, i.e. 11.1, 2, and 3. Do we have questions to staff? Councillor Layton. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker, and through you to staff. First of all, congratulations. Phase two of, uh, of, of this monumental piece of work has been uh, largely com completed, and we're moving on to phase three, implementing the implementation strategy. Um, so I thank you very much for, for your work on this. A couple of questions. So why the necessity for the phase in on the invasives management and ecological restoration? <clears throat> so uh, through you, Madam Speaker, the idea around the phase in is to allow us to uh, um, implement the program based on capacity to implement. So the idea would be in the first year on the invasive species management, we create an additional crew, create additional supports around volunteer management, assess the success of that, and then phase in similar things in future years, but also have the capacity to change the program if we need it. Okay. Um, now, on the capital side of the budget, there's no recommendations going to the budget committee from executive, um, and this is because you need more time to do work on the preliminary planning for the capital work, correct? Through, through you, Madam Speaker, that's correct. There is, there is $104.5 million of additional investments not currently in our 10-year plan included in the ravine strategy implementation. And our, our desire would be to do the planning work around that $104.5 million uh, in preparation for the 2021 budget while continuing with, as the report indicates, there is already $465 million of capital work across the city and with TS TRCA included in the existing 20 to 2029 capital plan, but it only represents our existing level of service. It does not advance all of the principles within the The additional $104 million dollars recognized. Now, all of us probably know your capital team for the amazing work that they do, they are stretched thin. And I personally, for one, wouldn't want any of my capital projects that are on the books for next year slowed down as a result of you doing the additional work. Are you able to accommodate the planning work for this additional $104 million 
So th through, through this in your existing envelope. So through the speaker, uh, and as the report indicates, we currently have $5 million annually allocated to ravine implementation in our capital budget. That's for a number of smaller projects to move forward. Uh, we would be uh, accessing those funds uh, if we required more staff to advance the capital planning. So work won't be slowing down on advance, uh, on any other projects as that's a result correct. of you yeah, that's shifting correct. some resources in order to get us on track for the that's $104 correct. million. That's correct. Okay, great. And the $104 million, that was um, 10,000 square, uh, 10,000 foot level that's assessment. We don't know specifically what work that pertains to, so we couldn't allocate capital funds. It is roughly allocated towards various projects, but based on the estimates of the consultants we had working on the project, on similar projects that uh, in other areas, either of the city or in other cities. So it's it's very roughly estimated and some additional work needs to be done to hone in on the exact numbers. Could you quickly explain how those 10 uh, sites were, or ravines, sure. priority areas were chosen? So the ravine system was split up into 105 segments. Uh, and um, through the strategy, we selected what we called the 10 priority investment areas. An external consultant looked at those 105 segments and singled out 10 for, uh, for immediate investment uh, that had and looked at issues of ecological sustainability and health, access into the ravines, growth in and around the ravines, and whether there were existing infrastructure projects that were uh, going on. Also looked at resiliency and how those sites could uh, contribute either to the resiliency of the larger system or needed investments to increase their own resilience. So this wasn't based on the number of phone calls your office got or not. political pressure. This was an, an assessment of the ecological integrity and all of the other things you mentioned that determine those Externally. 10. Externally Just, done. Externally done. Thank you. Um, just to ask, I, I briefly looked at the biodiversity strategy, which um, depended heavily on the implementation report that's before us on the ravine strategy. Um, are you confident we're going to be able to achieve all of the goals of the biodiversity strategy, which looks specifically mostly in ravines of sensitive biodiversity and, and important areas? Are you confident that the resources you've laid out will allow us to also achieve all of the elements of the biodiversity strategy? So to the speaker, the, the strategies are intertwined. It, there are similar staff groups that are working on the biodiversity strategy and the ravine strategy. It's all part of the uh, interdivisional collaboration that we are doing. So the intention would be that the biodiversity strategy and the ravine strategy goals in the implementation would, would meet, uh, certainly, and pay attention to each other's strategic you know, initiatives. So whether we can meet all of the goals of all of them, I'm not sure I could confidently say that, but we can certainly bring them together as a joined planning approach around the implementation of both. Thank, thank you. Um, <coughs> so, so members of council, okay, mayor. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I I just want to remind council that you know where we're at on the agenda. So we are dealing uh, with the mayor's key item EX twelve point one as well as um, IE eleven point one two and three. So when we're asking questions. It's on all four items. So just so you're aware. Okay, thank you. Councillor Carroll. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I didn't know it was a combined item. My, my question is really uh, around the strategy, uh, however. Um, I couldn't find it, I couldn't find it uh, in any detailed way in here. What I wanted to ask was around, since there is a direction here, to go to the province to talk about funding from other levels. There's another conversation I'm wondering if, the, if this has been contemplated. Um, and the, the question comes out of my experience uh, in a, a development application in my own ward, abutting a, uh, adjacent to a ravine. And it was further upstream, so it was TRCA property, and they were excellent at negotiating and then requiring that the developers spend the money on you know, restoring top of bank, renaturalizing that ravine, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Since you're going to the province anyway, do we have the same sort of uh, legislative oomph to have that conversation and achieve some uh, uh, development dollars to get us to some of the, po the components of the strategy when it's adjacent to the parks property part of a ravine? So th through the through this 
Truth, through speaker, complicated question because there are varying legislations and bylaws as, as an up. example. So uh, <laughs> we do have the Ravine and Natural Future Protections Bylaw in the City of Toronto. And yeah. there are many other legislative frameworks, both provincially and federally, that come into the management of the ravine system. Yeah. So to, to your question around requiring the investment from adjacent building or building close to the ravine, right. through TRCA and through the requirements of various planning approaches, I believe we do have the tools to require the appropriate investments to ensure that the ecological areas are restored and protected when there is um, um, infrastructure development in and around the ravine system. So even if it was, even if the site went beyond TRCA and was now adjacent to parks, you would sort of partner up with them. That's correct. To achieve the same thing. That's correct. We don't need to add this to the provincial conversation. We do not, and we already okay. work hand in hand with the TRCA in addressing those those objectives. Right. Okay. Thank you. I just wanted to check since you're going up the hill anyway. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cole. Uh, yes, this question of staff. Um, given the daunting. Uh, financial challenge you have in uh, undertaking all these strategies uh, for our ravines. Uh, have you given any uh, consideration to exploring the opportunity of creating a Toronto Ravines Conservancy? So through, through you, Madam Speaker, one of the recommendations in the report is around uh, a ravine campaign and a ravine leadership table. The idea would be that uh, a number of partnership um, pursuits are evaluated by the committee, and part of that would also include uh, a consideration of any alternative management structures within the ravine system. So while we haven't recommended it directly in the report, we certainly expect that the ravine leadership table would look at some options that we can consider and work with them around what options might come forward. But we have not uh, explicitly uh, recommended any one structure in the report because we know there are a number of different options available and there are a lot of dependencies on the partners at the table and, and some of the capacity. Uh, as you know, uh, New York City uh, created a conservancy uh, to uh, protect uh, and enhance uh, biodiversity in Central Park. Uh, have uh, your staff looked at that model at all, a way of getting funding? Through, through, through the speaker, we have. We've looked at a number of different conservancy models, Central Park certainly being one of them. Uh, there's another one in Millennium Park in Chicago that we've looked at. There's the Assiniboine Conservancy in Winnipeg that we've also looked at. So there's a number of different models. I can say confidently none of them um, some of them have, have similar characteristics, but they're all very different uh, depending on uh, the groups at the table, the circumstances in the individual location. So uh, we have had a lot of internal discussion on it, and certainly it will be an item uh, uh, for key consideration as the implementation moves forward. Yeah, and the other, uh, in terms of partnerships and uh, uh, getting uh, collaboration from other uh, entities, uh, has the school board or the school boards ever been approached about establishing a partnership whereby uh, local high schools or elementary schools could adopt a ravine uh, adjacent to that school? Has that ever been fully explored with our uh, friends at the TDSB or the Catholic School Board? So through the through the through the speaker, we have uh, it's a great idea. We have many partnerships with all of the school boards on various sort of single projects associated with various schools in various locations. I think through the advancement of the operating, the additional operating funding in the ravine system, especially around the invasive species management, we will be able to expand the number of projects we can support with external partners. So I think the ravine strategy lays the foundation to pursue more of that work in the future. So I'm just wondering whether that could be expedited uh, by uh, a motion uh, whereby uh, council takes upon itself to set up a, um, uh, a an exploratory meeting with the school boards in establishing this uh, ravine partnership with our schools. So through the chair, I think it's a great idea. We'd have no objection to that at, at all. Yeah, because wouldn't you think it'd be, as you know, I'm sure you think it would be wonderful if you know, we could get our uh, students to basically uh, learn 
uh, about biodiversity and botany and uh, everything uh, uh, in their local ravines rather than sitting in a classroom. Uh, but they could uh, explore, walk, and uh, plant, etc., and not just be asked to litter, uh, remove litter once a year. It's a great idea through the, through the speaker. Uh, there could be some connections to the uh, curriculum development in those schools as well. So we're happy to explore those ideas formally with, uh, with both school boards, with all the school boards. Okay, thank you. I have a motion with the clerk regarding. Thank you. Councillor Lai. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, through the chair, um, on page 14 of your report, there is um, identify all the list of a priority investment areas for the ravine. What is the strategy and budget allocation to address invasive species for the ravines outside of these 10 priority ravines? So through the speaker, uh, we, uh, we continue to have an existing uh, invasive species uh, investment uh, currently in the city of $2.6 million. And the strategy does recommend advancing the invasive species investment uh, over a four year period with an additional $2 million, which essentially doubles the investment over a period of time. Our invasive species program is not just specific to those 10 priority investment areas, it is throughout the ravine. So that program will be expanded and our hope through the strategy is to be able to address more of the invasive species issues that we have right across the whole system. So in other words, um, they will c cover some of the city parks. That's correct. Thank you. And uh, in my ward, in Ward 23, we have lost a, a creek due to some of these invasive species because you know, it hasn't been dealt with for a long time. And you know, how would this strategy address this problem? So through the speaker, part of this strategy, again, is to uh, you know, double our investment in invasive species over time. There is also, uh, through this strategy, an additional focus on partnership with the various entities that are involved in invasive species management, which includes research and metrics and partnering, uh, as well as if possible, accessing any provincial or federal funding that is available to address invasive species management. So in other words, is, is there a, funding, a federal funding and provincial funding to deal with this matter? Through the speaker, currently there is not. But there is? There is not. There is not. But it is certainly an item that we will be advocating for. Our understanding is that uh, Toronto is not alone in its battle with invasive species and the spread of invasive species. And we believe it is an issue right across the country that will need some additional attention over time. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Pasternak. Uh, yes, thanks, Madam Speaker. Um, it came up in committee, um, and it's a very important point that 40% of the ravine lands are, are on private property, and we do have <laughs> do a, of a publication to help own owners, but there is um, a lack of clarity on how this is distributed to some of the key homeowners uh, who are in fact uh, on ravine property. And I'm just wondering how we make sure they understand their responsibilities and their rights as homeowners uh, on our ravine properties. So through the speaker, this is an ongoing issue given half of the 11,000 hectares of, um, of ravine land are on private property. So this publication was something that was done uh, just last year, I believe, or in 2018, to help private homeowners educate them on how to manage the ravine lands on their property. Um, we are planning through this strategy a more uh, comprehensive communication strategy to try and reach as many private homeowners as possible, uh, either through various social media, through our website, uh, or if need be, through direct mailings to some of those homes, especially in the areas of the city where there's significant private property encompassing uh, some of the ravine lands. So another issue in committee that we discussed was uh, enforcement and uh, illegal dumping, uh, even open, open fires, uh, I guess uh, illegal uh, use of firewood, cutting down of trees. What, where are we going with enforcement of our ravine properties? And I realize they're extremely vast areas. The topography is not easy. It's not easy to send staff in there, but 
the plan doesn't seem to really put a lot of so emphasis on enforcement speaker, of our rules. I mean, there are there are various layers of responsibility around enforcement. I and and I through the plan, we will be increasing the full-time permanent presence of staff in the ravine system, both through the invasive species management program and through the litter collection program. So through that process, we will be able to identify more of those infractions, so to speak, and ensure the appropriate uh, enforcement techniques are implemented towards them. Some of them may be around tree contraventions, other may be around litter disposal, and a number of things. And we'll be tracking those and the follow-up uh, to ensure that we have good data on what we are able to enforce in a more comprehensive way prior to, to what we're doing right now. So as, as you know, Toronto Water is, is uh, w one of the main divisions that uh, has to access our ravine properties for infrastructure investments. Now, when it comes to restoration of those lands after, after there's serious digging and infrastructure, uh, installations. Is it the responsibility of Toronto Water or a third party contractor or PFR to restore those lands? I'm, uh, Mr. DiGeronimo is going to answer that. Through you, Madam Speaker. With respect to restoring um, any ravine that, uh, that is damaged, either in a planned construction project or on an emergency repair basis, uh, Toronto Water all, would always take the lead on ensuring. Uh, the restoration, whether we do it with our own forces, whether we do it in conjunction with uh, Parks, Forestry, and Recreation staff, or using outside contractors, we would take the lead, though. Okay. Now, uh, thank you very much. So you've you've identified ten priority areas. Uh, obviously, for other areas, there's there's concern. Now, uh, if we looked at a horizon, when would you be looking at the second uh, the second ten? Uh, areas to invest in? Through you, Madam Speaker. So the report does indicate the evaluation criteria that we use to identify the 10 priority areas, which are sc scattered right across the city, not in any one, you know, focused area. So they are uh, through a number of different parts of the city. The idea would be through the, the first 10 years of the plan, 2021 to 2030, uh, those investments would roll forward and we would at the same time reevaluate the other existing uh, uh, segments of the ravine system to see whether any needed to be moved forward uh, into, into a, a higher priority uh, and establish the next 10 years of the strategy as a result of that. I should say the investment plan around the ravine system is a longitudinal investment strategy. It is not a short-term uh, piece, and we believe there will be required ongoing investment uh, for, for, many, for many years to come, even beyond this 10-year capital plan. So we won't be looking. We won't be looking to the second uh, ten spots for another ten years. We will be reassessing within the next five years whether yeah. they what the next ten should be, and and uh, and whether there are any that should be reprioritized any sooner. Thank you. There you go. Councillor McKelvey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my questions follow on some of the ones that we heard earlier. Um, the first is you've established the leadership campaign table, um, but that could you kind of speak a little bit to the mandate of that committee? Sure. So through the speaker, the idea around the leadership table uh, actually came up through the uh, development of the ravine strategy itself, where we did have a group of very interested stakeholders uh, who were very interested also in the philanthropic uh, piece of it, but also in, to Councillor Cole's questions, the management of the ravine system. So the idea would be to bring together both key stakeholders uh, in the ravine system, uh, academic institutions, a number of stakeholder groups, but also key business leaders, key philanthropic leaders to, uh, to, to help guide the campaign, both around as a first initiative of the loop trail uh, which is outlined in the report, and also uh, to, to launch the into, uh, into the Ravine program, this microgrant program that we're suggesting through a partnership with Park People, and then to reassess uh, the, the capacity for a campaign on the larger issue of philanthropy and both private investment as well as 
uh, public sector investment through the city, the provincial government, and the federal government. So, so that table would act as a sounding board uh, for a lot of those initiatives moving okay, forward. Okay, so it goes beyond financial, but also looking at partnerships, and it, it does include the academic community, because I was uh, giving a guest lecture last week. They asked me about that specifically, so there is a role for them to be That's at the correct. table as well and participate Absolutely. in this. Okay, um, my second question is about the management and how how you see this going as is it a nimble management structure that where you can reevaluate um, priorities change we know that there are you know severe weather events that may have erosion happening faster than we thought or flooding so like is there ability to not just wait five years but kind of as events happen to re reprioritize to make sure that we are keeping those spaces open for the public but also addressing public safety Absolutely, through the speaker. Uh, one, one of the objectives, as outlined in the report, is an interdivisional group that also includes the TRCA. And, the, and this is the first time we've actually had a group, a, a multi-divisional, multi-sectoral group that is planning together for the resilience system. So, and to keep that planning as fluid as possible, especially given some of the environmental circumstances that we're dealing with. So if there is an environmental uh, event that changes some of the, the plans, that committee will then be nimble to actually rally across the city and with our partners to address those, those issues as we move forward. So that's exactly the intention. And uh, I know in the report you mentioned that the ecosystem services that are offered by the ravines are approximately 822 million annually. Is there plans to be revising that number uh, as these investments are made so that we can see how our financial investment is having a return on investment in terms of ecosystem services. Absolutely, and I think through the partners we have at the table, we will be able to do an ongoing assessment of that financial impact for sure. Uh, part of the partner aspect of, of the strategy are active, that have already been implemented, active, <clears throat> excuse me, partnerships with the University of Toronto and their forestry uh, folks, as well as some external agencies that will be helping us in that monitoring uh, as well as TRCA. So I think we will be able to track that over time. And my last question, for this leadership table, will this be um, open for people to apply and be considerate? Like, how can we be very open and transparent in this process so that we are making sure that we're not leaving people out that should have a seat at this table? Through the speaker, we're just working through that process. Uh, and, and once available, I'll be happy to share it with you. But the idea would be there would certainly be an opportunity for people to be involved. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Holliday. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, the questions I have are, I think, on IE 11.1, <clears throat> on the tree canopy study. Um, some really big numbers in here, and I, I was impressed to read that we've increased our tree canopy from by about 2%, 3%, depending on the, the method used to measure the trees. Is that correct? That's correct. So what's the, what's the actual number? Do we know how many trees there are in the city? And, did we? I'm going to say in, in approximate through the speaker, uh, when uh, the, the, uh, the initial tree canopy study we did several years ago uh, indicated there were 10 million trees. Through the advancement of the, the, the actual forest management plan, yep. we've advanced 1.4, yeah. 1, one, an additional 1.4 million trees in the city. So the total is now 11.4 million. Right. And, and so what can we attribute the growth to? I know we planted a lot of them. So this is speaker, we can attribute the growth, uh, you know, quite specifically to the forest management plan that, that council approved several years ago, which advanced the number of trees that we were planning, advanced a number of partnerships, and also advanced tree health so that more trees were surviving for a longer period of time. Uh, and that was addressed through increased investments in things like pruning and tree maintenance uh, of city-owned trees. So it, it has all of those things put together have advanced, uh, you know, that number. But humans didn't plant every single one of them. I, I'm assuming there is some organic growth the trees propagate, and we help create conditions to do that. That's correct. Okay. Now, I, I, I just want to switch it around because we've had lots of discussions about this in the chamber. Um, tree removals. So we grow, I think it was 120,000 trees a year about. If you figure that over the 10 years of the study from 10 million to 11 million, sounds about right. Um, how many times do people ask to remove a tree and how many tree removals do we permit in the city? How many do we deny, just roughly? So through the speaker, I'm estimating, uh, you know, we have about 6,000 requests to remove trees annually. It might not be exactly correct. Okay. 
Uh, and the number that we approve, we approve. About 10%. Or, sorry? About 10%. About 10% of those, uh, okay. and then for the for the appropriate reason, uh, okay. whether it's tree health or or whatever the request is made, uh, and then there's a handful, of course, that that are uh, that are that come to council for further decisions. They're appealed. So of the t of the 600 or so that we approve, a very small portion of those go to appeal. That's correct. Um, we have uh, so juxtaposed to 120,000 trees. Is is that a material? Is that a material amount? Uh, th through the speaker, uh, it de you know, I, I, it depends on the type of tree that's being removed. Each has different sort of benefits, but uh, it certainly, over the time of the study that we've done, has not negatively impacted the outcome that we've seen. Okay, so it hasn't. It hasn't. We obviously wanted to save as many trees as possible, but understood. We but have been able to balance the needs appropriately. Okay, so there's a, there's an aspirational goal of 40 million trees. I think is the, sorry, 40 percent coverage, uh, and that if I'm doing simple math, right? You know, 120,000 trees a year buys us a couple of percent over 10 years. You know, is there any way at the current trajectory, or even a slightly more trajectory, we're going to hit the the 40 percent coverage? I think it's by 2050, if I've got that right. Yeah, what's the target? Yeah, uh, through the speaker. I mean, there are I. I I believe, you know, in the study, the study uh, clearly articulates the things that we're doing very well and the things that we need to pay more attention to over time. And it will allow us to change our service plan to address those threats to tree health. I should say one of the biggest threats, you know, similar to the ravine strategy to tree health is invasive species. Uh, right. And that was clearly articulated in, in the report that went to council, uh, as well as the unknown threat of of various infestations that, that we don't know about. Uh, you know, we have dealt with a few very, very successfully. And even despite those infestations, such as emerald ash borer and a few others, Asian longhorn beetle, we've been able to advance the plan through, you know, very strategic investments. So right. the report talks about our friend, the Norway maple, and it's that's on right. decline. And just lastly, our tree protection bylaw controls uh, public trees and private trees. Um, the bylaw essentially says healthy trees are not removed and are really our only filter point is whether or not the tree is larger than 12 inches. Anything smaller than that we don't look at by the tree protection bylaw but once it hits that stage essentially the tree must be in decline in order to get a permit or, or through some other process but the answer is generally no as long as the tree is healthy. Uh, and that's correct. If, if the tree is healthy we would Say no, uh, unless the tree is in the as of right of the property owner's house where we don't have any jurisdiction. Thank you. Councillor Thompson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. Um, to the staff, I rise to ask uh, a number of questions and uh, certainly to say that I'm very much in support of the report that's in front of us. Uh, in August uh, 2005, we had a major rain, thunderstorm, and so on. And in my ward, we had a, an area on uh, Ellesmere where the culvert uh, attached to the ravine caused a tremendous amount of erosion with respect to the backyards for those residents who are living in that area to the point where some almost lost their properties entirely. My question is, in areas across the city, where culverts are part of that natural ravine formation. Are you testing and looking now to see whether or not you need to redirect the positions of those culverts in terms of how they're impacting the landscape? I'm gonna ask Mr. DiGeronimo, that's sure. more specific to some of the water management issue. Sure, uh, and that's a collective of people looking at this. Sure, <laughs> through, through you, Madam Speaker. Yes, I remember that Bendel Ravine issue and. And we had a series of, of culvert issues throughout the city yes. on multiple storms. Um, so we've been, uh, we've been asking and working with uh, our colleagues in transportation services, because some of the culverts um, are under the responsibility of that division. Uh, but in addition, uh, conversations with the Toronto Region Conservation Authority, uh, particularly if it's a creek and a ravine, um, as, as we have to work uh, on how much flow is going through there um, and how do you redesign that. So those aren't cheap propositions 
because culverts are expensive. But what we can do with our colleagues in par uh, parks, forestry, and recreation is do some uh, tree management around there. So if you do get that storm, you, you don't have the large logs piling up and blocking that culvert, which can cause some of the erosion and ponding in the areas. Sure. I, I'm glad you point to the fact that it's expensive because I think we need to test that. But I think something that's perhaps even least more expensive is the formation of rocks and so on in advance of any of these issues occurring. I'm wondering if you've considered that. Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, yes. What we've done with the Toronto Region Conservation Authority is we've gone through and mapped out um, throughout the city all the areas where we have critical erosion right. or, or areas of concern after each uh, successive major storm event. And uh, Council actually approved a policy in 2014 and how we coordinate work um, on those major erosion sites. So Toronto Water will be protecting city infrastructure issues, while TRCA will handle the private property issues that are on ravines and have similar issues. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, uh, my next question, Speaker, to staff. Can you tell us what is the um, percentage of invasive uh, species that exist currently in our ravines? Do you have that information? Okay, so what are we through, trying through to fix? Speaker, it, it, it went from 15% overall to 32% overall, which is why many of the recommendations point to the need to manage invasive species better. Right. Um, can you then also help me to understand, and I think there's been a number of questions asked around communications and, and, and that sort of planning. Uh, I note that uh, in our case in uh, the Burke Hill Ravine, we have had several years of having to work with the residents in terms of helping them to understand how to manage their own properties and contain um, materials on their property, such as grass clippings and a number of other things, because what they tend to do is they tend to just throw it over to the side, not thinking that it actually has an adverse effect and impact on the soil and on the ravine in general. I'm just wondering, what is the communication plan that you're going to put in place to help to ensure residents can understand their, uh, their stewards, in fact, to maintaining the ravines? So through the speaker, as you know, we, we did start the communication plan with the booklet that was, that was made around private, private property and, and, the, and management of the ravine system, which was a first that we'd, we'd never done before. Uh, as indicated, through the implementation of the strategy, we'll be looking at a more comprehensive communication strategy. I can't tell you the details of it Fair right enough. now because we Fair. haven't developed it, but we will be looking at a number of different approaches. And I should say that through the advancement of both the litter pickup and the invasive species, we will be having more interaction with those private homes. And just one final question. Uh, screening for the bike path and so on to create a buffer for residents, are you planning to incorporate that as part of the process? I believe so, for the speaker. We can certainly take that under consideration. Thank you. Okay, um, I, I have to ask for a quorum call because we do not have quorum in the council chambers. <laughs> Members of council, please press your buttons to indicate your presence in the chamber. Madam uh, Speaker, there are 19 members in the chamber. Quorum is present. Thank you. Councillor Kerjanis, questions? Thank, Thank you, you, Madam Speaker. Through you to the staff, uh, certainly uh, appreciate all the work that you've done. Uh, however, I do have a couple of questions. My question is, what happens when somebody gets up to cut a tree? What fines uh, are we imposing? Do we have um, regulations that the person which, which is cutting the tree besides the homeowner be licensed? Are we looking to licensing them? Uh, like 
when we do have somebody that's paving driveways, they have to be licensed. A, a, an application has to be made, and the person making the application, the homeowner, has to have somebody which is a licensed uh, so a person to do the, the uh, Mr. Speaker, a few different levels in that question. So the, the first is um, we do have a fee, a contravention fee, when, when there are trees that are injured or removed uh, without permission, if that was the first part of, of the question. And that contravention fee is about $750 per, per occurrence if an enforcement officer has to visit. On, on the question around um, licensing, we do on the website have a list of connections to various licensed you know, arborists for homeowners to pursue on their own uh, as, as an avenue. But certainly that the, the industry itself is not regulated to the extent that you're explained when you know around the license requirements uh for tree removal if that's the question so if i question. want to cut a tree do i have to get a permit from you yes i, you I do. think it has to go through council and all that stuff not through through the speaker uh Some, well, yeah. sometimes it has to go through community council if right? if, if there's an appeal on the permit it would come through community council and then to council um and then is there a fee that i pay in order to cut down the tree as an, as a homeowner if, if you make a request to remove a tree and the request is approved, there's an application fee of, depending on the size of the tree, the location of the tree is a little bit you know, different, um, but uh, the homeowner is then responsible for the cost of removing the tree. And if I don't, if I don't have an application, all of a sudden uh, I might have a cup of coffee, I might feel the urgency and I take the chainsaw and I just zoom it. What so, happens then if I don't? So have if I could just, uh, Councillor, I've paused your time. Um, you. I, I'm I, I'm at a loss as to what item you're speaking to right now. I'm speaking about trees and protecting the trees. With in the context of the ravine strategy or one of the other items. They're combined, uh, Speaker. Because that that but the fee is not in question. The, yes, but that but the fee is not a question in those items. That's well, in order to cut a tree down. We're talking about tree protection, and right. in order to cut a tree down, you got to get permission. If you don't, then you're not protecting the tree. So I think I'm I'm, I'm in order. Oh, okay. As long as we're not going to the 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 quantum of the fee, because that that is before budget committee right now. No. I'm okay. Just asking, Thank you. I, I I stopped your time during the, you that much. clarification. So the fee that is applied for for is. Seven hundred and eighty dollars shy of seven hundred and fifty two dollars. Okay, thank you very much for that. Now but seven hundred and fifty two dollars does not replace a tree. So I'm just wondering, have is there any thought in your department about approaching um, approaching the provincial government about doing a, uh, a, uh, a legislation that is more more enhanced, more enforced, more more uh, more hands-on, more appliable that says to the people, look, you get the tree down, that tree's a 100-year-old tree. You know, there's gonna be consequences. Is there something, right. is there a thought so, to that effect? Through the speaker, there are, you know, we have reported, I'm not sure in this report, but certainly in others, uh, on the powers that the city has if a tree is removed uh, without, uh, without an approval. So the, the city can pursue the homeowner through prosecution and recover costs, and there are, are fines then that would be uh, charged. And we have demonstrated that over the last several years, the number of prosecutions in that regard have increased quite substantially. This year when we had the snowfall, the Transportation Department sent out a, a mailer and it said to people, this is what we do and this is what we don't do and everything else. I hear from a lot of homeowners, well, I didn't know I'm not supposed to cut the tree. The tree's in my backyard, that's my property. I'm just wondering, do we have communication tools, not, you know, in, in different languages? Are, are we doing an approach that, that says to people, you got the tree, there's going to be penalties. You want to get the tree, this is what you got to follow. A lot of people that are buying properties think that the tree in the backyard is theirs. It's my property, my tree, I can do whatever I want. And I don't think that's a, that's the message so that we want. Through the speaker, uh, we, we haven't, uh, I haven't personally heard those concerns, but if there are that, that you're hearing from your constituents, we'd be happy to revisit the communication tools that we have around the, the bylaws that are in place around, around that. They're all on the website. We have done a number of direct sort of informa information campaigns in various parts of the city, but happy to, 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 to have another look at that, particularly if there's residents in your ward that are concerned about it. All right, I thank you very much. Um, our officers that are, are going out to sites where the site is, um, 
is being for reconstruction. Um, what, what, once somebody brings in a building permit, what, correla what working relationship do you have with the buildings department and what information do we give those homeowners that want to tear down a house to, uh, uh, you know, when you tear down a house, uh, like a, a demolition permit, and you want to put up a house, and, and what, what coordinates do we give them in order to protect the tree? There was one situation in my area, 2590 and 2592, the guy was having a demolition permit, and he went inside, and he started, you know, attacking the trees. I mean, what information do we give them? I don't think in a demolition permit there was something there that, that, that addressed that issue about protecting so through, your trees. The speaker, that was your last question. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's my understanding through those processes, whether it's a demolition permit or a building permit, all of the requirements around tree protection or tree removal are, are communicated to those applicants. Uh, we can certainly have another look to make sure it's being communicated as clearly as possible. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Speaker Nunziata is next. Yes, thank you. Um, I just have two questions. Um, when uh, a tree, when, when the city pl uh, plants trees on uh, city property or a private property, and um, as you know, they plant these sticks, and they're on the front lawns or on the boulevard, and, and, and the complaint is, is that they die. Um, so can you tell me, like, what, what is the maintenance part of those sticks? <laughs> so, so um, and because residents get frustrated because they, you know, you plant a tree and, and, and for years all you see is this stick on their front lawn. So th through the speaker, uh, uh, we do, uh, the, the planting program, <clears throat> certainly the city planting program on public lands, uh, we have an 85% success rate uh, on the, the, the health of those trees that are planted. Uh, in, in many circumstances, those trees are planted through a, an external contractor and have a warranty for a period of two years. So if the tree is, is, is not uh, healthy after that two-year period, we have, we have an, uh, the authority to request the contractor to actually replace, replace that tree, and that's what we do. Uh, it's true that many of the trees that we plant are very young, but the information that we have around the longevity and the survival of those trees is specific to planting these young trees that have a better long-term uh, rate of survival than planting uh, a more mature tree. So, so what do you have a percentage of how many of those trees that uh, have died? Well, eighty-five percent. Eighty-five percent survive. Live. Oh, live. That's oh. right. Fifteen percent die. Oh, okay. Um, just a question. Um, I, I was at a meeting last night in, in Weston, and the city, uh, Toronto Water is doing some major infrastructure work in that area, and so all the streets are all dug up. But in particular, there is one street where um, the residents have been notified uh, by the city or by the contractor that on the boulevard or on private property, there's these big mature trees, and they've been told that they might have to remove them. Um, they're very concerned because they want them. They want them to be replaced with mature trees. Um, so, can you tell me what would we? Do? So, through because the speaker, I, I may ask Mr. DiGeronimo yeah. to to uh, answer as well. But I can say that when those types of large infrastructure projects go on, we work collaboratively with whether it's Toronto Water or a private developer to look at. Uh, but this what is some the, the city doing the work. Trees. That's yeah. correct. And to address together a, uh, a strategy to ensure that there isn't a negative impact on the tree canopy, which would include a fairly uh, uh, comprehensive replacement strategy if those trees are coming down. Uh, but I'll ask Mr. But DiGiorno would they be able to, to be replaced with mature trees since these trees have been here for 100 years? Uh, through, okay. Through you, Madam Speaker. Um, the, the specific question of maturity tree, I'm gonna to have to defer to the arborists. Yeah. But what we do is, is we do work um, with, uh, with our colleagues to get the approval. So the project you're talking about in Weston is a basement flood and protection right. pro project, a lot of sewers being installed. Um, you do have interference issues in some cases uh, because it, that's a very old neighborhood and, and the trees uh, are quite large. Uh, so we, we do our best to try to uh, design the sewer so we avoid removing trees. We try to minimize that, but there are instances where we might have to remove a tree or two or because it will get damaged during construction. And we will get permission from Parks, Forest and Recreation and uh, we will put in the contract um, the required replacement. 
whether whether you can do a, a, a very mature tree, I don't know. I have to defer to the the arborist. I'm not an expert on that. So they've been told there were, there's approximately seven trees that are going to be removed, and they're not really happy about that. So th through the speaker, I you know I think we do our best to try and replace in in that particular circumstance with as mature trees as we can to try and replace the canopy in the area. But sometimes, unfortunately, in, in the instance, we try and balance you know, the, the goals of Toronto water against the, the larger impact of the tree canopy. And if a large tree needs to come down, uh, as an example, uh, to protect an area from flooding, uh, we will do our best to replace with as mature trees as possible. But sometimes it's not possible to replace a tree as mature as the one that unfortunately has to be. Removed. But as long as we don't put these sticks up. Correct. Um, so what I, I'm hoping that I will be at least notified if any of them, because you know these are really beautiful trees and the residents agree. cherish the mature trees they have in Weston. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Speaker Nunziata. Uh, Councillor Grimes is next. Thank you. Um, my question, I've got, this is a great book, by the way. I live on the ravine, and I haven't got one, so you can just deliver mine in hand. I borrowed mine from James here. But um, my question about in, invasive species. And I, I'm reading page 17, 18. It lists a whole bunch of common buckthorn, uh, garlic, mustard. Are these being sold out of, out of, in this book out of nurseries, or are these natural? Through the speaker, I, it's my understanding that you know, most of these invasive species are natural and, and spread naturally. Through various, you know, circumstances in the weather, or uh, through other seedlings that are dropped, and and etc. But so I'm trying to find out what an invasive species is. Is this something would happen if humans weren't even around it, or is this something that's? Yeah, There's I, a number of different ways for invasive species to come in. It could be through another country, uh, you know, a, a, a type of species that comes in from another country that has some kind of invasive component to it. It could be over time a small species that grows because of the environmental circumstance that breeds, you know, further uh, spread of that invasive species. There's a number of different ways, but our, our intent is to, when we do plant, is to protect the natural uh, you know, uh, domestic uh, um, types of species that we have, uh, and to plant as much of that as possible. Yeah, because I know in the Etobicoke Valley, Alderwood Valley, right. uh, we have some trees there that are, you know, hundreds of years old. And, uh, and I know, Janie, you probably won't be able to answer this one, but a couple of years ago, I remember we had um, uh, some, some plants were, were invasive species, but they were poisonous to people. We had to go in and spread. I don't know what the name of them are. Maybe Jason or Richard might know, but. I can hang on one second. Through you, Madam Speaker. Yeah, there was giant hogweed. Sorry, what is it, Jason? It was giant hogweed. The hogweed. So, why are we taking those out? Just because they're they are um, to protect the residents walking through there because they're poison. Is that correct? Otherwise, they, they would just grow and be a natural part of the ravine. Through correct? you, Madam Speaker. They're extremely invasive and they're harmful to, to humans and and pets. So, so what, yes, like, where have. did they come from? That's what I want to know. So, a lot of that stuff, those type of invasives, usually come through a global type of trade atmosphere. They're, they come over in some way or shape or form in soils. I mean, this is why the Canadian Food Inspection Agency regulates that type of import. Some of the trees, however, like Norway maple, were purchased to plant because back in the day, they, were, they, were, they looked at resilient trees. Um, it was only later on that we learned through science that they were invasive, so they weren't native. And so the science today supports planting native trees, indigenous trees, in their local environments. So, Jason, we do have people, you know, going through our ravines on a trail system, we wouldn't even be going after those, some of these invasive species, is that correct? We would be going after those invasive species. Even if people weren't going in there? Absolutely, they, because they have damage, they, they destroy the ecological uh, viability of the, um, the ravine and destroy biodiversity. So what we're trying to do is bring back a healthy ravine and we need to remove those invasives. Pretty big task. It is a big task. Right. And I guess one for my good friend, Mr. DiGeronimo, I know um, as I walk through uh, the, the ravine I live on in, in Togo Valley, you know, as you, as, you, as you travel through the ravine, you see a number of uh, big pipes, some not so big, some but becoming, and they're coming off our streets. Is that correct? Are we, is there a plan to stop them going into the ravines? Or? Uh, through, you, through you, Madam Speaker, uh, uh, what you'll see is a number of outfalls that uh, uh, provide drainage from, from roadways and properties into the ravines. 
Uh, and in fact, no, we don't want to stop them. But what we do want to do over time is improve the design of those outfalls. Some of, some of those pipes that were put in place over the years, uh, you just have the pipe there and you get a lot of erosion when you get a, a heavy storm of it uh, because it's coming out at such a velocity. We've been going in in the critical sites and repairing those. We've done some throughout the city, but we've got to do it on a priority basis where we see extensive erosion. And we, we completely change the design of the outfall, make it uh, stronger. We use a lot of uh, rock material to help slow down the flow and, and in fact make it look more natural. So there, oh. is, so there is a program to improve it, but we're dealing with the worst case scenarios first right. and then going. So through. that water eventually is ending up in Tobacco Creek or Mimico Creek, wherever it may be. I know in uh, New Toronto and Long Branch, we have a big capital project coming down the pipe where all those pipes that do go into Lake Ontario, we're gonna look to have a collector pipe to keep that out of the lake. So why wouldn't we be doing it in our ravines? So to keep that water because it goes into the creek, it ends up in the lake, right? So uh, for the most part, what, uh, with respect to the storm outfalls in, um, in ravines, if it is clean, cleaner stormwater, because not all stormwater is clean, we have to be aware of that. Uh, but if we are getting um, cleaner stormwater, we, we want it to go back into the natural environment so we have the flow in our creeks and rivers. Yeah. And so that's why we promote uh, putting it in those locations. With respect to uh, the project you mentioned that we're looking at, uh, we're looking at picking up outfalls that are right along Lake Ontario in southern Etobicoke. And uh, the reason we're doing that is there you have a combination of, of some older um, sewage uh, combining with uh, stormwater. A lot of it is stormwater outfalls, but we want to protect the nearshore water quality so we can use Lake Ontario. So that project is specifically looking at improving nearshore water quality in Lake Ontario so the public can have access to, to that. In the, in the ravines, we try to tell people to stay out of the water and allow nature to go, uh, go back and restore itself. Thank you. Councillor Fletcher? Uh, yes, and uh, my apologies if somehow this has been asked and answered already. But it has to do with, uh, there's dog, what are the names of them? Dog, dog strangling vine. Dog strangling vine, a few others. And down in the Don Valley, in the new part, my new part of my ward, apparently there's a lot of invasive species. And Friends of the Don and some of the Todd Morden Mills and the Wildflower Group, they've long gone in mm -hmm. and assisted in pulling that out. But recently they were told that they couldn't do that anymore. So I'm just wondering what's happening with those kinds of uh, groups that are citizen experts who have assisted the city and assisted the department in getting rid of some of these species. If we've changed our position or it was just because of the site, I'm unclear. And I'd like to know that answer today. Through the speaker, um, Sometimes the act of pulling invasive species uh, disturbs the soil even more and can have the opposite effect where it basically helps the invasive species spread and become even a thicker mat um, and a worse situation than it was in the beginning. So that kind of work needs to be done carefully uh, together in a measured way. And we, used to, we, we just have to monitor the reaction to the work that's being done. If it's effective, we allow it to continue. If it's not, we need to get on site with volunteers and figure out a, a different approach. So. And, and through the speaker, I'll just add that, um, that part of the strategy through the, through the increased investment in invasive species management, one component of that is advancing our support to volunteer groups like Friends of the Dawn so that they can continue to help and be involved in the response that we have. Because they had been involved for years and yeah, years. Yeah, and they're a great group. And then they got told no, and they weren't clear why. So we don't want to, I'm sure your intention is not to put off That's correct. citizen groups that do a great job. That's correct. So what would your best advice be then to re-engage them so in through, this through the speaker, we're happy to meet with them separately. They have been involved in some of the consultation uh, in this report because they are a primary stakeholder in the ravine system. So we have had some discussions with them, but we'll certainly uh, meet with them individually to go over what their plans are and how they would like to assist and how we can assist them in doing that. So since they're pretty veteran, you could also work with them and give them instructions if you're not pulling 
at least you can, I mean, I know they're all gardeners, so they all could cut if that's another option in order to deal with the rather large amount of this that's... But, yeah, we're happy to meet with them individually and go through what some options are. To get them back in yep. action. Your goal would be to get them back in action as quickly as possible? We have that goal. Good. Thank you. Mine too. Thank you. To speak, Councillor Matlow. <coughs> I have, a, I have a motion that I was just sharing with uh, Councillor Fletcher, given that it, uh, I think, is very uh, uh, in tune with uh, the comments that she was uh, making through her, her questions on behalf of her community. Um, first of all, I want to begin by, uh, so I move this motion, obviously, uh, and uh, I want to begin by acknowledging uh, uh, all the city staff who have worked on this strategy, uh, the mayor for um, actively listening to the residents of our city who have told council that our ravines are deeply important to us. Um, some, you know, some people refer to them as uh, um, the lungs of our city. Some people, you know, when we are so envious of cities like Vancouver who have mountains around them, they're like inverted mountains. They're, they're the places where we go to escape the busyness and the, the hustle of the city and uh, find some time to take a walk with our families and take some time to reflect and often get from A to B in a much more beautiful and natural setting. Uh, it's a place that, um, that my family and I uh, use frequently. Um, in particular, the Cedarville Ravine and, uh, and uh, the Yellow Creek, the Vale of Avoca. Uh, the Vale of Avoca, uh, we often take from the cemetery down to the brickworks, and we have a very engaged community there. And if it wasn't for the advocacy of that community who brought to the attention of myself and the councillor for the area at that time, Councillor Wong Tam, and now Councillor Layden, who is actively working with this community, we would not have known some of the most pressing concerns regarding erosion and invasive species and safety concerns that they brought to our attention, which we then brought to city staff's attention, and then we worked as a team towards moving forward with the geomorphic study and the work that has been now part of, uh, of our ravine strategy moving forward. The Cedarville Ravine is an area that almost was lost to the Spadina Expressway. And if it wasn't for those who came before us who fought to stop at Expressway going through this ravine, it would have been lost forever. This is a place where Cedarville residents uh, uh, take their dogs, um, those of us who grew up in the area would toboggan down the hill. Uh, and in fact, on a personal note, that's where my mom's uh, memorial bench is. And it's a place that I visit from time to time to just sit with her. Um, this is what these ravines mean to all of us. And the motion reflects, I think, our understanding that while we as a council are approving this and our city staff did the work on it, um, it's our communities who have advocated and pushed us to prioritize this strategy, but that's not good enough. Our communities want to be the stewards of our ravines and be part of the implementation plan and want to be directly engaged in that discussion, uh, as Councillor Fletcher spoke about uh, the Friends of the Dawn and others. Um, and those, uh, those of us who live near uh, the Yellow Creek uh, uh, want to be involved as well. So um, I just wanted to you know, move that motion on their behalf uh, to acknowledge the work that our communities have done and want to do on this strategy. But as a citizen, as a resident myself, I just can't think uh, uh, in, a, in a more heartfelt way um, to the mayor and to my colleagues for, and to staff for moving forward with the strategy because our ravines are, are just so deeply important and are often the, one of the best kept secrets of how great this city is. And let's not keep it a secret any longer. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Menon Wong. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I have two motions. Um, City Council direct the General Manager of Parks, Forestry and Recreation to consult with the local councillor when removal applications for healthy trees 30 centimeters in diameter and greater are applied for within the city's ravine and natural feature protection area bylaw limit. Um, the requirement not applicable when applications is for emergency work. And the second one is City Council direct the General Manager of Parks, Forestry and Recreation to consult with local with the local council when removal applications for healthy trees 30 centimeters in diameter and greater are applied for within golf courses located within the city's ravine 
a natural features protection area bylaw limit. Um, Madam Chair, uh, um, we have an extensive ravine system in my ward in the Don Valley, that's Don Valley by definition, Don Valley East. And like uh, uh, counselor, the previous councillor before me, um, uh, my residents treasure that area um, and they want it protected. So the first motion, and I did get assistance from staff to draft this, and I've talked to a couple of councillors, um, there seems to be no objection to this, is that when uh, the city or the TRCA comes into a ravine and they want to remove a lot of trees, especially large trees, that the city council be made, be informed of this. My first uh, iteration of this was to treat it like a site plan application if we got notice of it, that we could send it to community council, but staff suggested, let's say, a more modest approach, which I'm prepared to accept. Um, and I do have experience where the TRCA came into my ward, into a ravine, and they needed to do some construction work, and they took out mature trees for their staging area, um, which, I didn't, which I thought was inappropriate. The second motion um, I've had experience with, and this is where local councillors aren't informed, or where I was not informed, that a golf course was removing over 100 trees. 100 trees. And they were around greens. And these greens, as many, some councillors who have golf courses in their community, as you're aware, some of these greens are around homes. And these residents believe that those greens and all those trees help to beautify their, their, their backyards and their neighborhood, and they indiscriminately removed it with absolutely no consultation. And I, in fact, met with that golf course, and they said they wouldn't do it again. They would consult the next time, if ever had they had to do it. Two years later, they tried it again. And we were able to stop it, but there wasn't a formal process. This creates a process when golf courses want to remove large trees um, that, the, that the Parks, Forestry, and Recreation Department will have to inform the local councillor. And then the councillor can enter into a dialogue or direct staff to refuse the application. And there is an appeal process that it comes to this council. That's the purpose of these two motions. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Pasternak. Yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. I have, um, I have two, two motions, um, actually three motions. One is um, motions A and B are on the ravine strategy. And um, we were just, I was just talking among my committee members on when we'd, what is ideal for staff reporting back and giving us updates. And there's a general feel amongst uh, our committee members as well as um, some stakeholders that waiting five years for an update is a little long. And there's one stakeholder that wants a, an annual report, and we thought that was too soon. So this amendment uh, gives our committee uh, three-year updates on the advancement of the ravine strategy. Second part of the motion um, lists three items uh, that we'd like included in the updates. Uh, the stewardish, stewardship program, uh, protocols regarding citizen volunteer engagement, and ways to engage the city's private ravine landowners. Very crucial to this plan to adopt stewardship programs for their properties and leverage existing provincial programs if, if feasible. On the uh, federal um, tree planting uh, item, um, our schools, our local schools, uh, in all our school boards, and including private schools, uh, represent uh, somewhere in the vicinity of 800 properties across uh, the city with enormous tree planting uh, potential. In order to come anywhere close uh, to the goals that we're trying to achieve as far as tree canopy is concerned, uh, we should really be having our school boards and our schools, including private schools, involved in tree planting initiatives. And I can tell you uh, one of my great memories of uh, elementary school in 1967 was when uh, we walked down to a local park and uh, planted a tree as a group uh, during our centennial year. Uh, and I'm sure uh, many, many school-aged children will love to do that uh, in the years ahead. So when it comes to the ravine strategy, first of all, I'd like to thank staff for their work on this file. Uh, it's, it's very comprehensive. It's um, easy to understand. Uh, it is a, a, a protection plan that I think uh, we can all endorse. And I mentioned a committee, and I mentioned in a press conference, uh, that I grew up uh, near a ravine. 
And uh, it was wonderful running through the ravine, along the riverbeds, uh, among, among the trees in the forest. And what we want to do is we want to re-engage uh, the residents of the City of Toronto to explore and use their local ravines. It is, it is a vital part uh, of our green infrastructure. It is a precious resource. But at the same time, uh, we want people to enjoy our ravine system. Uh, we need mechanisms to protect it as well. And that's what this plan does. This plan uh, gives us a roadmap to invite people to explore their local ravines, but at the same time, uh, keep our ravines healthy, uh, keep our, our, the users safe, and make sure that we, uh, we keep them accessible to all. Uh, at the same time, we have to really look at some of the major problems that we're facing in our ravines uh, that need some more attention. And one is um, the violation of our various bylaws. And that's the illegal dumping, uh, the off-leash. Uh, people are walking their dogs through the ravines uh, as an off-leash zone, not cleaning up after their pets. And of course, as I mentioned before, we receive uh, complaints of open fires uh, in our ravine system, which is extremely which is extremely dangerous. So that is something we must uh, look at as well. And I believe Councillor Cole might have a motion regarding schools. Uh, and that is another thing we have to do. We have to get school-aged children uh, into our ravines uh, as far as experiential learning, appreciating the ravines, understanding what they're there for, and the great role uh, they, can, they can play. So in summary, I would say that we've got a, 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 a workable roadmap in front of us. We have a funding source. The mayor is committed to having some of it funded uh, this year, which is excellent. And it's important for our committee, infrastructure and environment, to get more frequent updates so that we can track progress. Sometimes progress requires more funding. Sometimes uh, progress requires more community engagement. And we have to know that three years from now not five years from now. So once again, thanks to staff for their good work, and we look to forward to supporting you at committee. Thank you. Councillor Layton to speak. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, all good news. The mayor kind of uh, mentioned that in jest when I was asking my questions, and he's mostly right. Like This is a good step for the city of Toronto to take. It's a good, implement, impl, a good and realistic implementation strategy. And when, what, I'll, I'll get to the but. It's, it's more of an and today, it's more of an and. Um, the, uh, there, there's a lot of thanks that need to go ar around for this uh, to our city staff for uh, for sticking with it through now multiple years of working on on this strategy, the councillors that were involved in its early early days, Councillor Wong Tam, my predecessor for the, the the Mud Creek and the Yellow Creek, where there's a lot of work getting done, Councillor uh, Matlow as well for pulling together the the Midtown Ravine Working Group, which is a group of uh, a, a dedicated community members that have been not only helping drive the ravine process citywide, but in particular in the geographic location that's been identified as one of the priority areas and who have been sticking with it uh, through, um, through what has been a, a long process in achieving what we have. Um, I'm very pleased I don't need to move a motion today because the motion I would have moved was moved by the mayor and executive at the executive committee where this, uh, where this motion was. Um, I believe that our ravines, 300 kilometers, 1,100 hectares, 70% of our city is incredibly vital to not only our current health as residents, the health of our city as a sustainable economic organism, as well as a, a, a part of the larger regional and international geography and, and, and ecosystem. It's just, it, it's the, the, the but is that it, it's good news that we've now right turned the ship in the right direction. It's bad news that when you go down into our ravines that they're suffering so much. That it's not only a little bit of litter here or there, some plastic, single-use plastic bags 
uh, uh, blowing in the breeze in the trees. It's the enormous toll that lack of investment and climate change have together taken on the infrastructure in those ravines. The, the water infrastructure that we depend on so that our basements don't flood, to the ecological, uh, the, the ecological infrastructure that the birds depend on as they're migrating through our city to their roosting grounds north in the boreal. These are systems and pieces of infrastructure that are beyond us. They're beyond us individually. They're beyond us as a council. These are, are living and breathing things that we've been entrusted and that through this report, we are going to invest in to restore. I woke up a couple days ago to my neighbor who was knocking on my door, who said, Mike, Mike, you gotta go out back. You're a nature sort of guy. There's two foxes in your backyard. We live at, Christ, at, at Christie and Bloor. Like, this is not a, a ravine location. This is not a, a, a rural setting. This is downtown Toronto, perhaps not tall building downtown Toronto, but it is downtown Toronto. There's a vacant lot, site of a new Catholic school that's being built just behind my house. Two red foxes were, were, were huddled there in the snow, not bothered by all the, the gawkers, including myself, that were taking pictures, not quite selfies, but pictures from a distance. The, the reality is they don't have habitat in our city anymore without the ravines. That's how they get around our city. I've seen deer off the DVP. We see all manners of hawk and other raptors in our, in our ravines, that if we continue to allow them to degrade, if we don't make the investments starting this year, we're, gonna, we're, we're, we're in danger of losing more of that, of that habitat, more of those species that help bring such vitality to our city. And if that can't convince you, if those two foxes and those birds can't convince you, think of all the calls you're gonna get from your residents when basement flooding gets worse or when their backyards are falling into the ravines because that's going to happen. It has happened, it will continue to happen if we don't make inv in investments like these. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Cole to speak. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I have a motion uh, that uh, City Council requests the General Manager of Parks, Forestry and Recreation to meet with directors of Toronto Public School Boards for the purpose of exploring partnership opportunities whereby schools would adopt their local ravine as part of their curriculum to support ravine sustainability and protection. Uh, I just think uh, uh, there's a uh, great opportunity here uh, uh, based on this report. There are so many people really appreciative of our ravines. There's so many people that care passionately about our ravines. So we have that strength in Toronto. On the other hand, there are all these threats. And uh, this is why it's critical we support this report and continue to find ways of encouraging more care, uh, more uh, investment in protecting and sustaining our ravines. As a number of speakers already said, uh, you know, I remember Robert Fulford uh, wrote a book about uh, Toronto in the 90s, and he said, the ravines are to Toronto to what the canals are to Venice. Again, let me say that. You know the canals of Venice? Well, we have the ravines of Toronto, and we have got to start to uh, profile them more. You know, we've got uh, so many newcomers coming in Toronto, uh, we have to reach out to them uh, to explain and to have them share and partake in the ravines. And in fact, if you go uh, in a lot of our major ravine uh, open park spaces on the weekends, it's our newcomers that are in all the ravines because they don't have already the resources to own cottages or get out of town. But you'll see Wilkett Creek and all up and down the, the uh, greens of space of Toronto are newcomers with their families eating, dancing, singing. Uh, they really 
appreciate the ravines, but we have to also reach out to them and engage them in ravine protection, sustainability, and understanding. Uh, I just think the school boards are a missing partner. You know, our ravines are living classrooms. Where else could you learn about botany, uh, biology, uh, forestry? Right next door to a school, there's probably a ravine that could uh, be a, an open air classroom where the children can go. I'm thinking of where uh, the, the, the mayor has some uh, great ravines areas. She's trying to always keep away from us, but she's, uh, but th there's beautiful ravines uh, in the western part of Toronto, up and down the Humber Valley, incredible connections of ravines. It's one of the most beautiful parts of Toronto. You know, the Don River Valley gets a lot of attention, but the Humber River Valley is beyond belief what you see and what you can experience from uh, Lake Ontario all the way up to Steeles Avenue. Uh, and I always want to remember, remind the, uh, the speaker about Lavender Creek. If you want to see a beautiful part of Toronto, take a trip to Lavender Creek, which is a tributary of uh, the Black Creek. Anyways, I just want to get uh, to the schools. Um, we have to approach them to have a formal relationship whereby they partner with uh, Parks, Rec, and Forestry to uh, adopt these ravines. It's not good enough just to have your annual ravine litter cleanup day. It has to go beyond that. It has to go to where they learn about invasive species, uh, about planting, about the water courses, about the uh, diverse species in our ravines, as mentioned here, everything from foxes to uh, coyotes to uh, deer, uh, foxes uh, are really more and more prominent, it seems. So that's why we have to partner with the school boards. And, uh, and you know, what better time? You know, we've got this incredible uptake as a result of a little young lady uh, who's going all over the world. She's 14, I think now, whatever she's, maybe she's older. Uh, Greta there, she's going everywhere. The kids are so excited about doing something about climate change. Let's take advantage of it. Let's excite our young people here in Toronto. And they will, they'll go into the ravines, they'll plant, they'll clean, they'll, they'll learn about how precious they are. So it's a great opportunity. On this report, we can go forward and really create thousands of Gretas all over the city of Toronto that will take on these ravines and uh, adopt our local lovely ravines. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Fillion. Uh, thank you, I have a motion that City Council request the General Manager Parks, Forestry and Recreation to consider including in the ravine strategy additional sites where significant development is occurring adjacent to ravines and where development related funds are available to improve access and enhance the ravine system. Um, so first of all, um, thanks to everybody involved in this and great, uh, great work all around. This, is, um, uh, this motion just puts into words something the staff have said they would do anyway to the point where I don't need to make the motion. Uh, the reason I'm making it is because there is currently a project that I'm working on that I think um, I could probably obtain some Section 37 funds for, and it just makes it easier in the current uh, Bill 108 climate to um, be successful in those negotiations if you have something to kind of hang it on. So I wouldn't want... Um, um, anyway, it just makes it easier to achieve objectives if, um, if it's um, in writing and it's, again, it's something that the staff are saying they would be um, doing anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Kergiannis. Madam Speaker, I do have a motion that I'd like to put up. Basically, the motion speaks to the fact that um, I would like to have uh, the General Manager of Parks, Forestry and Recreation to report to the Infrastructure and Environment Committee on the feasibility and process of increasing the contravention inspection fee, 
fees charges where a second plan prevention inspection is required and undertaken in order to determine compliance with municipal code 813 and everything else. Madam Speaker, there's many people out there that on the weekend they want to be, uh, if you want to call it uh, forestry uh, uh, individuals and want to get up on their, um, the tree and cut it down, may have a cup of coffee, they don't like the shade or and they would de determine, hey, well, you know, that tree needs to come down. And, and these people need to be educated, and these people need to be told, number one, we need to do prevention. And uh, I know that in speaking to the uh, director, she will take it under consideration to make sure that uh, communications go out to the individuals that, that buy new houses, individuals that have houses, that you just can't get up on a ladder and cut your tree without permission. Number two, if a person still is determined to... Uh, to get up on uh, and cut a tree, and I had in my area trees that were 150 years old that were cut down, and, and people certainly, um, you know, when you approached and said, "Would you cut down the tree?" Well, you know, it was my tree; it's in my backyard. I think these people need to get a message out there that hey, you can't cut a tree down. You got to give permission to cut a tree down, and the only reason that you can kind of get a tree down is if the tree is sick or you're building. On, on, on the on the property uh, where the tree is located. Madam Speaker, I'm looking for my colleagues to support this in order to make sure that, uh, one, if possible, and uh, the determination gets made for us to increase the fees, that uh, people get hurt in their pockets, and that's the only way that people will start learning. Because if one person cuts a tree down, although he or she is told not to, and then they, they get a hefty fine, then they will tell their neighbors, and their neighbors will think twice about cutting down a tree. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Councillor Holliday. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I have a motion. Thank you. I'll paraphrase it, but it's just to ask for a report on the feasibility of changing our tree protection bylaw. Um, to look at the criteria to permit the removal of private trees by residents with a specific condition. Uh, and that is that whatever the replacement is, it increases the canopy. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, the council's very familiar with many of the arguments we've had here. Uh, black walnuts come to mind, uh, problem trees growing up against people's houses. And uh, many circumstances, uh, you know, I've, I've talked to the residents, as we all have, and Often they'll say, look, the staff told us they're very sympathetic to, uh, to the situation, but the, the bylaw is crisp and clear, and I brought it out in questions. Uh, the tree is healthy, maintainable under the criteria. Um, they can't allow it to be removed under any circumstance. And so this is just taking a look at it. But, you know, the, the reason why I brought this is I looked at what the report said. We're aspiring for a 40% coverage of canopy. And uh, in 10 years, we managed to increase that by a, uh, a couple of percent. It's a lot of work. It's 120,000 trees planted per year uh, to get to that goal. And so it's, it's going to be a tough, uh, a tough run to get to that particular goal, just given the growth rate that we've got. And so the, the concept here is, is, you know, can we give a little to get more back? And the idea would be is we require replacement trees when anyone removes a tree lawfully. And uh, instead of asking just for an uh, uh, the concept of replacing the tree, maybe we can ask for the concept of actually adding more to the canopy, whether it's on site or somewhere else. Uh, someone can pay for the cost of planting additional trees and help us along our goal on that. The other point in this is, you know, can we balance out... Councillor Holliday, hold on. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Can I get some quiet, please, in the council chambers? It seems like everybody is speaking at the same time. I can't hear the speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We, we've heard of cases of stress and anxiety that people have faced with respect to a particular tree. And again, I'll go back to those, those stories we've had of black walnuts coming down and making damage or injury. And can we show uh, a little bit of flexibility with these residents? And I don't propose to open up the doors here but can we stretch those criteria a little bit? If I look back to the numbers that the general manager provided in questioning, uh, she said that there were 6,000 trees applied for to be removed and only 10% were permitted to be removed, that's 600. And maybe this criteria would allow a few more to go through, but the goodwill with the public, I think, would be immeasurable. 
And in particular, I'm thinking of some of the constituents that I've dealt with that have been in really tough circumstances trying to deal with a tree on their property that was causing damage or was too close to the property. And, you know, I don't think this will propagate a mass removal of trees across the city. First of all, the practicality is, is that it costs a lot of money to remove a tree. You don't just wake up one day and chop a tree down. You have to plan and go through that process. And people do that because they feel that they really need to. Um, but I think the goodwill that would come out of this in terms of how people feel about their city and their confidence in government would be a lot. And it's a, it's a fair trade for a few extra trees in, in the scale of 120,000 per year or uh, 11 or 12 million trees in the city. What's a couple of more with the idea that you could get a few more back at the end of the day? And maybe it will encourage people to plant more trees on their property. Some people are apprehensive about adding trees because they know of the burden and the responsibility that comes with them and the restrictions that we put on as a city. So uh, understanding that there might be a little bit more flexibility in the rules if you run into a problem in the future might entice more people to put uh, private planting on their property. At the end of the day, this is a report request. It's asking for the feasibility. I don't know what the, the criteria could be. Maybe it's trees that are 14 inches instead of 12 inches might be the critical dimension. Maybe it's certain species like uh, invasive species like the Norway maple um, that, that pose a problem. Maybe it's things like black walnut where the fruit drops and can cause some issues. Again, I'm not proposing we open the doors wide open, but we look at some of the issues that residents have faced. And if there's a little bit of flexibility in the bylaws, a small flexibility that isn't going to, uh, that would actually result in a better tree canopy at the end of the day. I gain the public confidence and, um, and making our residents happy uh, will pay itself off in innumerable ways. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Councillor Peruzza to speak. It's ready. Okay, Councillor Peruzza. Yeah, so, so Speaker, I'd like to um, to move the um, uh, that motion, and and I just want to, I I don't have a whole lot to add to this. But just simply to say that I agree with Councillor Cole's progress, uh, sort of poetic. Uh, description of what our ravines mean for the city of Toronto, uh, much like the you know the canals of Florence or or of uh, Venice. Sorry, uh, you're right. Yes, absolutely, all of those things, because our ravine system is absolutely beautiful. Now the name of my riding or the ward is called Humber River Black. Creek. Beautiful. Let me repeat it. Poetry. Humber River, Black Creek. Two very major, significant ravine systems in the city of Toronto. In fact, the Humber River, I believe, is, is our only uh, designated heritage river. All right. So, and, and you'll, 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 you would know why if you, uh, you know, sort of go down into the Humber River Valley system. Um, it was used by uh, natives as a as a trail that extended from Lake Ontario to Lake Simcoe, with many many villages along the way. And the reason why that's the case, uh, uh, Speaker, is because the Humber River is absolutely a magnificent river that flows through the city of Toronto, and a good chunk of it flows through. My, I believe that profoundly. But I have to tell you, so every spring, because you know you get frustrated with our parks department, because they don't, simp they don't have the resources to clean our ravines. But every time you go down there in the, in the springtime, when the foliage, and, and I don't want to speak to the invasive species and all these other things that we're doing, and all those things are wonderful. But I, I just want to speak to the sort of the state of our ravines. While there's some magnificent features in there, in the springtime when the snow thaws, and the, the plants don't have foliage, you get to look at our ravine system that in many places is absolutely disgusting. It's full of garbage. 
plastic bags get all blown in there and they get caught up in the in in the trees and in the shrubs and in the bushes shopping carts, um, shopping carts uh, refrigerators air conditioners tires. tires bricks blocks people use them as illegal dumping sites so so Early on, in, in, when I was elected councillor, I would organize, and I still organize every spring, a number of people to come at school groups and so on to go down and clean the ravines. Some of the things that we have dug out of the ravines, in fact, last year, a, a 38 revolver, like, you know, like, you know, like, uh, you know, along with the refrigerators and along with the air conditioners and, and, and all of those kinds of things. In fact, in fact, in front of me, and people just simply snub their nose at this. In front of me, I was riding my bicycle one night on Driftwood Avenue, just north of Finch Avenue. And the sun had just gone down and kind of like dusk was setting in. And at Driftwood Park, I'm riding my bike on the street and this truck, you know, with this covered kind of like canopy above it, pulls up into the park. Because there's a curb cut, hey, it pulls in. And they meander into a part of the ravine that's got some bushes and shrubs in full public view. You know, uh, 10 meters off the curb, off the sidewalk, off the street. People are just absolutely brazen. And I'm, I'm watching this and I'm dumbfounded. And, these, and I pull up to them and, and they're about to kind of like, it's, it's one of those reclining trucks and they got like a bunch of bricks and blocks and stuff in the back, and they're about to dump them. And I said, you guys aren't about to do that there, are you? And they look at me with this like hard look, yes, hard. like I'm taking my life in my own hands. And I said, you dare dump that? I got a picture of you. I got a picture of the license plate. I got a picture of the truck. And I'm headed right over to the police station. And I'm going to make sure that you guys are like done for good. Thank you, Councillor so, Peruzza. So they look at each other. Thank you. I'm just concluding, Speaker. No, I know, but you're over five minutes. And the reason I move the motion is we need to be able to up our fines. We need to be a, a little more aggressive with right. people Thank who you. absolutely have every intention of disrespecting our ravine Thank system you. that way. Thank you. Councillor Wong Tam. Yes, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I'd like to also rise to lend my voice to support uh, the staff recommendations and the report that's before us, uh, and also to thank uh, the mayor as well as uh, the members of the Infrastructure uh, Environment Committee uh, for shepherding this through. Um, it, it, uh, it goes without saying is that the local residents, uh, many of them who actually live close to the ravine, who see it as an extension of their, back their backyards, over the years they have been pleading with us. Uh, they have been uh, compelling us to do more, and I think this is probably the very first substantial step where we're doing that. Um, and that's not without uh, a lot of years of advocacy where they felt that probably uh, city council and perhaps even staff uh, with the limited resources, perhaps with other priorities where they didn't pay attention, and we did not. Uh, so this is actually a really great move in the right direction. Uh, the ravine system is obviously um, not just a natural extension of many people's backyards and front yards, um, but it also has a, has a very diverse and wild history. Um, and I think we need to acknowledge uh, the, the path and the tra trajectory of what we used the ravines for in the past. Uh, not only was it just sort of uh, untamed wild space uh, where, it, where it had no curatorial experiences, but it oftentimes was really the, the landfills of the city. And so it's not surprising that we still have a, a mixed result in relationship with the ravines when for 100 plus years we literally just used it as landfills. Uh, it, it also then became home of industries. We had brick producing um, uh, industries that were uh, in the, the foot of the ravines, the pit of the ravines. We had a rail system that went through the ravines that transported uh, goods and raw materials from the north to the south as we built up our city. Uh, and it was also a place where we just buried infrastructure that we didn't want to see. And so all that infrastructure that is now popping up that is ha largely uh, coming to see the light where it's reached, it's beyond reached the end of life is all before us because it was there. And we didn't necessarily have a system to transition it to new infrastructure that can accommodate the next 100 years of growth. Um, but it's just sort of coming to, to, to the surface and decaying which makes it much more expensive as we transition our mindsets to what the ravines will be in the 20, 21st century. 
Um, so if we take a look at the history of the ravines, uh, we also recognize that it's a, it's, a, it's a complicated history. So it's no wonder that there are continued additional pressures in the ravines today, where we still don't have that sort of grand master plan that is necessarily pulled together with a mobilizing vision that we can all get behind. One of the things that I think is really great about this report is that there's going to be a dedicated ravine unit of staff. That's good. Stewards, people in charge, they're going to be dedicated with the, the expenditures, and that's a very positive thing. But we also have to resource them to make sure that they can do the work. One thing that we have learned over the past uh, probably decade at the floor of council is that all the plans in the world aren't going to help us if we don't actually resource uh, the staff to do the good work that they need to do. Um, and that four, $462 million in capital dollars spent over the next 10 years, uh, we will have to fund that. Uh, and there was originally a, a big conversation, I think, where there was probably a shift, a, a political move uh, and pressure to go find private dollars and philanthropy money uh, for the ravines. Uh, we cannot rely on that. Uh, that is not something that we should, should see as our core source of funding. Uh, we are going to have to make that critical investment. And if we, and if we don't, and if we rely too heavily on private third-party funding, uh, then there's a very good chance that this, this particular positive step in the right direction will just fall to the, the wayside. Uh, there are a number of uh, roles for every division uh, at the City of Toronto to, to take a, a place in order for this implementation strategy to, to work. Uh, by count, there's already seven internal city divisions that have got to come together to coordinate this work. And on top of that, there's civil society groups that we want to work with so we can harness that energy. But we can't necessarily invite people to the table until we have a plan. So this is actually a very good first step. There's a plan. There's also on this, on this report, on this agenda, we're going to be talking about Rail Deck Park, which I think is a very innovative and, and, and masterful solution to parkland deficiency in the downtown core. But when we have 1,100 acres of natural environment already at our disposal, and 5,700 acres of those 1,100 are in, in public hands, we already have the most largest green contribution the city can do, uh, can, can muster. All we need to do is curate that, build better connections, better connectivity, better access points, and then to build out the experience. Before you invite kids into Ravine, that has to be safe, and it has to be the right learning environment. Thank and you. they can grow with us to do that work. So thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Fletcher. Thank you, Speaker. I just have a very quick motion. Um, that City Council direct that the 2020 annual Clean Toronto Together give special emphasis and assistance to Ravine Cleanup. And I've checked with the general manager. She said, what a great idea. Um, because, you know, every year so many citizens get involved and this would be a great emphasis to get our ravines cleaned up to a great degree. And uh, we've all seen what's in there. There's a lot in there that shouldn't be there. So I think that would be kind of exciting and show that we are really, really serious about our beautiful ravines in the City of Toronto. I think Councillor Matlow talked about being in them, the quiet, calm, I'll call it the ravine magic, when you get into these beautiful spaces. They often have little streams running through them. The city has so many underground rivers that lead to the lake. And in our ravines, that's where we find them. And remarkably, often, that water is quite clean. <coughs> what we've noticed as well, though, is that many invasive species in the ravines, Norway maples everywhere, and very few other things are growing. And the fact that we are spending time and energy and our encouragement to people who are passionate about ravines is great because these trees do have, we need ravine management in the most serious way. I also just want to say that a couple of years ago, uh, don't mess with the dawn, Irene Vanderdrop called and said, oh, we run every weekend in the dawn valley and it's so filthy and we need to get it clean. And there's other partners I've talked about here that are the Toronto Field Naturalists or Friends of the Dawn that go in and take out the dog strangling vine so I think really today one of the things we also need to do is thank all of those incredible activists, people that care about green space in the city, that have been leaders for 
decades leaders for years in looking after these magical places in the city that we have that are very, very special for the city of Toronto. So I just want to thank them today on behalf of all of us. And uh, this is a great, great, great report. And thank the mayor for his leadership and really saying we're going to do this. So I expect that this year, Mr. Mayor, when you're going to clean Toronto together, I'll go with you to a ravine rather than uh, just a sidewalk. We should focus on that for the 2020. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor McKelvey. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, thank you, Councillor Fletcher, for that interesting motion and great idea, and I'd like to come with you to clean up in the ravine as well. Uh, this is a really exciting implementation plan, and it does a few things that I think we should all be so very proud of. The first is that it's recognizing that our ravines, which cover 17% of our land, are really important green infrastructure. And it starts to put a dollar value onto those ecosystem services that they provide, and that's $822 million annually. That is the amount of money that we would need to spend on slope stabilization, water treatment, and all those good things that our ravines do. So there's a huge return on investment when we invest in our ravines. And there is indeed much capital investment that is needed. And all of us need to talk to our MPP and MP counterparts to let them know that this is something that needs their investment. The second thing that I think it, we should all be very proud of is that this report recognizes that people are part of the environment and it looks at them together. And when we've separated that in the past, that's when we've not been successful. And it's really, it's about connection. It's about connecting people to nature. It's about connecting people to each other. And it's about connecting the ravine systems themselves. And one of the things that's included in the implementation plan is an 81 kilometer connection of the loop trail and the meadowway. And that's 81 kilometers that can be used for active transportation, for hiking, for walking, for cycling, and for, for both recreational, but also getting around the city and getting to where you need to go. Many people have spoken about growing up in the ravine systems and spending their time in them. And I was one of them. But I also want to point out that we have more than 500,000 people right now that live in apartment buildings that are more than 35 years old. They don't have backyards. This is very important space for them. They also, 94% of them don't have air conditioning. So we need to make these ravines more inviting so that people can spend time in them outdoors in the summer. I just want to end by congratulating all the city staff that put so many hours of hard work into this project, into this implementation plan, uh, and also thank the mayor and his executive committee for taking the steps to push forward with the invasive species cleanup and the litter cleanup uh, as soon as possible this, starting this year. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Thompson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. I have a motion, um, and it basically is asking uh, the staff to um, investigate uh, partnering with uh, Trees Across Canada with respect to part of the implementation. And I know that they do some work with them and a variety of other things. Uh, uh, Trees Across Canada is an, is an amazing organization that, in fact, I'm sure would be delighted to work with uh, our city staff on this um, a very important uh, project. Uh, I want to first of all thank uh, certainly the mayor and his leadership with respect to this file and to thank the staff for their great work and this is a really good report. Um, speaker, what's extremely important with respect to this master plan is that it's actually funded. Um, there is uh, uh, capital, so putting our money where our mouth is, quite frankly, will be instrumental with respect to the improvements of our ravines. Madam Speaker, I live, my house backs onto a ravine. I, can, I can't begin to tell you the amount of joy that myself and my family have on a daily basis in terms of living in this area. My neighbors as well who back onto the ravine. Uh, in the summertime, quite frankly, I don't need to go to a cottage because I'm in a cottage in Scarborough in my neighborhood and it's absolutely wonderful. When I sit out in the back of my deck, I can actually see the animals, I can see the foxes, I can see the deers, I can see the birds, beautiful birds, I can hear the crackling of the leaves and so on. 
A number of years ago, Madam Speaker, we, uh, in my office, my team, we decided that we needed wayfinding for the young people in the community. Many of them didn't really know what the species of um, trees and other vegetation it was in the community. We launched a program, and it wasn't a citywide program, it was just a community program with our community association where we put wayfinding in the community, put signage to give people an opportunity to learn about the Burkdale Ravine. We also partnered with one of our uh, sister cities around the world at Sagamihara, and we planted uh, sequoia uh, trees, uh, cherry blossom trees. We redid the park there. We put benches in where people could actually go in. This is a, a, an abandoned space in the ravine area, and we invested in it. This council actually supported the collaboration with our sister city in Japan. The Japanese uh, um, leaders came over into the park with the community, and we opened it up today. When those uh, trees bloom, it's absolutely amazing to see the members of the community come out and so on. And so, Speaker, we've done other things in there. You see people um, come to do uh, uh, exercise because we have exercise equipment in this ravine area. People come, they cross-country ski, they walk, they ride, they do other things. But I also want to thank the staff because they actually get out and they shovel the, 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 the pathway every time there's a snowfall in order to ensure that our seniors and the residents in the community were very active or actually walking in the community. It's basically adjacent to Thompson Park. So there's a bigger area where people can expand their reach in terms of uh, activities in the community. So ravines are important with respect to our environment and our structure. Many cities around the world would love to have what we actually have in our, in our city that we take for granted with respect to our ravines. So I'm very happy and actually I'm very proud to see the focus of attention on the ravines because they're a valuable asset to our community. My community benefits from it on a daily basis and I know personally my family benefit from it on a daily basis because of where we live. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the last speaker, Mayor Tory. Um, I have a motion now. I've just got to put my hands on it here. It's right here on my desk. Um, it's been pre-circulated, so people have seen it. Uh, there it is. And it just has to do with the um, an effort that we should undertake to ensure that if there's any of the new capital, if I could call it that, that uh, uh, can be uh, advanced in the 2020 budget, that we are trying to identify that and get on with it. I, I made uh, comments, and I don't propose to repeat uh, what I said in my comments introducing the executive committee report. Uh, that um, you know, we, we have a lot of capital that is committed in the pl present 10-year plan, and it is being deployed and implemented as we speak. And to me, uh, there's a lot of that to, to uh, keep us occupied, as it were, and at the same time, then we can take the time with the 104.5 million uh, to do that, uh, get that included into the next 10-year plan properly, as opposed to uh, simply rushing when we already have $400 million committed uh, to add it. But I think it's worthwhile to have uh, our staff uh, take a look uh, at, at what's in the 104.5 million, I think I have my number right, uh, and see if any of that can be included in the 2020 uh, capital plans uh, for purposes of uh, implementing this sooner. Um, I, I want to thank uh, the members of the council for what I think has been a very constructive debate, and there are plenty of motions here, um, and uh, we'll deal with those in a moment. Um, I do think, though, what is happening here is something that uh, we shouldn't lose sight of the significance of it uh, in the context of true city building. Um, it is a place, I heard Councillor Matlow and others referring over the course of the debate to the fact that they use it. Well, of course, so do uh, thousands of Torontonians, but thousands fewer than should be the case. And it's part of the balancing act we have to, you know, perform here, which is to sort of make it accessible enough and keep it clean enough and protect it um, and, and encourage more people to use it, but without in any way kind of causing it to become a place that is overrun by uh, human beings or their various contraptions that they would uh, take with them uh, into the ravines. But, um, I think if there's, uh, you know, if, if there are things that we're going to do for the next generation, let alone the current generation of Torontonians, it is going to be to protect uh, this asset, to improve it, to address the invasive species. I frankly learned more during this entire exercise about invasive species. To be frank, when I first saw the expression when I became mayor, uh, I thought it was more about sort of animals and critters and things like that, as opposed to what it is, which is, uh, you know, greenery that we would call it, that looks innocent when you see it, but in fact is strangling. Uh, a lot of the, uh, the, the more uh, favorable greenery. Um, I think as well that uh, people haven't, including ourselves, perhaps even haven't enough drawn the connection between this work uh, and uh, this initiative and the uh, 
overall efforts we're making with respect to climate change and, and a sustainable environment and so on in the city. And I think this is going to be an important contributor to the health of these ravines, which somebody said earlier on, I think it was again Councillor Matlow, it's funny that I should be quoting you twice in one uh, council <laughs> I think I have to conclude my remarks now, Madam Speaker. I'm just kidding. I think you said that people call them the lungs of, of the city and, and so on. And th this is the truth. I mean, if you think about how the city would be without those ravines, if that feature wasn't there, um, it would pose a much bigger challenge for us in the context of, of keeping the air cleaner and keeping the water cleaner and, and generally having the city be a healthier place uh, to live going forward as we try to address uh, climate change through a Transform TO and other uh, initiatives. I think things that are in this plan, like the loop, uh, represent one of the most exciting things on a global scale, not just a local scale, not just Canada, on a global scale to sort of take this incredible ravine asset and connect it up. And one of the things I talk about, I was talking about it last night in an unconnected manner, talking more about social connection and about economic connection, but one of the things we have to keep working at every day in the city is connecting the city up to itself so that people don't feel, no matter where they live, that they're isolated geographically. Uh, people feel that they can use things like the loop, which is around the whole ravine cluster, as it were, in such a way as to sort of explore the whole city and get around, and that people feel, of course, most importantly, they're socially and economically and otherwise connected uh, to the city in which uh, they live. So this is great work uh, that is being done. And, and the last thing I want to say, because I didn't spend enough time on it this morning, you never can. Um, is to all the different people involved. And Janie would help me with a list that will be incomplete when I start mentioning names, but there's the TRCA, yeah. there's the parks yeah, people, the there's the, uh, here we go, I know. Well, she'll shout it out. Well, ja Councillor Layton will shout it out, because I shouted at him earlier today. But I was shouting in the happiest of way to say, celebrate good news here. But the TRCA, parks people, Evergreen, and there's a long list of people who have helped the city staff at the core. Uh, to put together the plan first, which was a great step forward in 2017, and then to have the implementation plan, and now they will, of course, carry the laboring oar on actually doing the work of implementing this. And so I thank them very much, and I hope they will, and, 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 and through them, and also through the miracles of online carriage of these broadcasts, uh, that the organizations that have helped us, and will continue to help us, I hope, uh, will be thanked as well for everything that they've done to get us this far. It's a big, big, important step forward, and I think the city in generations to come long after we're gone uh, are going to uh, thank us for this work we did today. Thanks, Speaker. Thank you. Recess to 2 o'clock.